Well, well, it looks like we have everyone. So I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of November, sorry, January 17th, 2024. Um, we have two agenda items. We have a monthly update on the AHEAD model and global payment development. Uh, Michelle Degree will lead that discussion. She's our health policy project director. And we'll be hearing from Pat Jones, the interim director of healthcare forum at AHS, and Shule Garovich, our um, consultant from Mathematica Policy Research. And then later on this afternoon, we'll have an update on Act 167 and the round one community engagement for hospital transformation, which will be led by Marissa Melamed, our Associate Director of Health Systems Policy, and we'll hear from our consultant on that work from Oliver Wyman, Dr. Bruce Hamery. So I'll turn it to uh, Director Barrett for her Executive Director's report. Thank you, Chair Foster. I want to let everyone know that yesterday the board submitted it submitted its 2023 annual report to the legislature. That report is located on our What's New page. It's also located on our website under legislative reports. Um, it's lengthy, but it's actually, uh, I just, you know, I'm always so impressed at our team and what we accomplish every year. And I just want to shout out to the entire staff um, and thank you for all your work and also the contributions to the annual report. Um, I also wanted to let you know that there's uh, two ongoing public comments, which are very relevant to today's board meeting. Uh, the first one is an ongoing public comment on a next potential all-payer model with CMMI. Um, as I've mentioned in the past, uh, uh, AHS and the administration are leading the negotiations on this model. So. When you send us public comments, we send those over to our colleagues at AHS and share them with them. Um, I, we also have an ongoing public comment period on the community engagement work in Act 167 of 2022. At the last check, we had 94 comments on that work. So keep them coming. We'd love to get that public input from all of you. And then uh, scheduling this evening, we have a primary care advisory group meeting. We'll be hearing from Pat Jones again, um, Interim Director of Healthcare Reform, and she'll be joining the PCAG and discussing the AHEAD model and the NOFO, similar to what she's sharing with all of you today. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Okay, and we have some meeting minutes to um, address. They're from December 20th, 2023. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. All those in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Um, I didn't hear Dr. Merman. Did uh, you vote, uh, Dr. Merman? Sorry. Yeah. I agree. I'll take that as an aye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, the minutes are approved. Um, and we'll turn to uh, Michelle Degree to walk us through the head model. Um, bef before I do that, though, I wanted to flag that um, I'm going to take public comment after each section of our presentations today. So it's possible that we have an executive session and Ms. Degree will talk about that, but I'll try and take public comment after the public portion of the presentation um, so people don't have to wait if there is a, a, an executive session. And we'll try to make sure we get as much as we can um, done before that. So, uh, Mr. Gree, I'll turn to you. Thank you, Chair Foster. I just want to. Can you all see my screen? Yes, and obviously you can hear me because you're nodding your head. So uh, today we are um, doing a, a pretty robust update um, at covering two topics, uh, primarily the AHEAD model and global payment development. Typically during these, you have a staff update from me on um, the board's kind of staff processes with the um, the global budget tag work group. Since we haven't had one of those and we don't have another scheduled until February, my portion of this will be very short today. Um, and as Chair Foster no 
noted, there is the potential to enter into executive session in the event that any of the questions or comments would um, relate to possible or potential negotiations with CMMI or CMS on a future um, AHEAD model agreement. Um, I think we're all um, aware that at this point, the state has decided to apply for the model. Um, that does not mean that we will be selected or enter into negotiations necessarily, but in the event that happens, uh, we want to make sure that we can have these conversations. And so um, I've pulled, well, thanks to our general counsel, got some <laughs> information here on the screen for you in the event that we do decide to go into executive session. Um, just a couple of notes. Um, it will need to be uh, there will be need to be a motion to enter into executive session. So I will defer back to you all should we choose to do that. Um, but at this point, I think uh, in the <laughs> the event of not having tons of time today and a huge, huge, robust agenda. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Pat Jones and uh, Pat and Shule, I have the slide. So just let me know when you'd like me to advance and I will run from here. Great, thank you so much, Michelle, Chair Foster, members of the board for letting me come again today to, um, to provide an update on where we are with the AHEAD model. So you can go to the next slide, Michelle. The first few slides I'm going to go through quite quickly, <clears throat> especially given the time constraints. But I um, you know, I feel like it's important every time we talk about this um, complex potential model that really sort of levels it. Um, why we're here, why we're talking about this. So this is actually a Green Mountain Care Board slide, um, and it you know delineates the work for Act 167. The work that we're talking about today is a subsequent all-payer model agreement with the federal government should that come to fruition. Next slide. So why, um, why consider a new federal model and why now? Um, you know, in its most basic sense, as you all know, um, when we engage in discussions about healthcare reform, we're really trying to use the public policy process to address challenges in our healthcare system. And you all know, as well as anybody, um, based on the work that you do, that we're facing um, lots of challenges in healthcare. And so I've listed some here with their related goals, but you know, ensuring affordability, improving access not only to care, but also to insurance coverage, optimizing quality and experience of care for Vermonters who seek care, improving the health of the entire population, improving equity, reducing disparities in health, health care and health outcomes, identifying and, and addressing those social determinants of health that really impact health status. Um, workforce is a huge issue that we've all been um, working on together. Um, reducing complexity too in um, healthcare, and that can arise in part if there's misalignment between public and private payers, and then trying to create a sustainable health system for the future. So, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about payment reform, but really that's just one component of healthcare reform um, we should think about as a means to an end. The goal really is um, for payment changes to encourage and support the care delivery transformation that leads to better outcomes in population health. So just wanted to really level set, why are we even considering this? Next slide. So you've seen this slide before, but one of the reasons why we're considering it now is that our current all-payer model agreement um, is set to expire at the end of, well, right now we've signed an agreement through uh, 2024, but we are in conversation with CMMI about continuing that model through 2025, but it will not, um, 
it will not extend after that. What the all-payer model agreement really does for us is it brings Medicare to the table in Vermont's health care reform efforts. So it allows Medicare to pay differently for health care and establish um, some statewide accountabilities. And so, um, you know, we have currently the all-payer ACO model. Um, the original performance period was through 2022. As I said, we have extended through 2024 and are looking um, to go into 2025 as with an extension. But beyond that, CMMI has made it quite clear that single state models like the one that Vermont has or Maryland or, or Pennsylvania, that they want to move to models that more than one state can participate in. Next slide. Um, you've seen this slide as well, so I won't um, spend too much time on it, but it really outlines some of the benefits of including to include Medicare in um, Vermont's health care reform efforts. Um, it builds on prior reforms. It gives us, you know, some ability to influence how Medicare reimburses Vermont providers. Um, it it's provides support for the Blueprint for Health, Advanced Primary Care Program, and for our SASH program, it gives us some waivers of Medicare regulations that can improve how care is delivered. It's alignment between public and private payers. And that really sends a good signal to our um, health care providers and other health system partners. Next slide. So ahead announced, uh, ahead is the next um, iteration of a federal model. It stands for states advancing all payer health equity approaches and development. It was announced um, on September 5th by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. November 16th, they released a notice of funding opportunity, which invites states to apply for the model. And I just want to emphasize here that really the focus in that, what we call NOFO, is that um, they really want to see, do states, and states have to be the applicants, do states have the capacity to implement a model like this? and how would states use um, up to $12 million that CMMI is offering in cooperative agreement funding to support the model. So a lot of the focus on the applications, which for cohorts one and two are due on March 18th is in those areas. What is the state capacity and how would we use that funding? Um, there's a link to the website there. I do want to note that um, again, that you know, the application really is the first step. It keeps us in discussion and at the table. Um, states have to be accepted into the model, and then states and CMS have to reach agreement in order to um, move forward. So think of this application very much as um, staying at the table on a first step. Next slide. Um, you have also seen this, and it's the AHEAD model at a glance, but just um, for folks who may not be as familiar with us who are listening in, it really lays out what the AHEAD model entails. Um, first of all, there are um, accountability targets that states will be responsible for, and that includes total cost of care growth, and that would be for both Medicare, traditional Medicare, or what they call Medicare food for service, and also across all payers. Uh, there are targets, and this is novel. This is something we haven't seen before in models, but they're looking for there to be um, increases in primary care investment. And so again, there are targets for the Medicare fee-for-service population and also for the all-payer um, population. And then equity and population health outcomes as well that will be determined if states are selected and they execute a state agreement with CMS. And then the components of the model are that cooperative agreement funding that I mentioned before, 
hospital global budgets are a really critical element. You're going to hear a lot more from Shule on that topic later. And then um, a primary care program um, called Primary Care Ahead. And then CMMI has outlined a number of strategies that you can see that they anticipate will support achievement of the goals of the model. Next slide. Um, I did want to sort of call out those statewide targets and show you how they bucket them. So they really look at um, the primary care investment um, targets and the quality and equity targets as um, addressing overarching goals of improving population health and advancing health equity and the fee for service, um, total cost of care and all payer, total cost of care growth targets really um, focus on that area of curbing healthcare cost growth. Next slide. And then the next one. You've seen this slide as well. Um, this is the application and implementation timeline. So for the states um, that want to be in either cohort one or two, they need to apply by that March 18th date. The difference there is um, how long of a pre-implementation period they get. Cohort one states would have a first performance year of 2026, cohort two of 2027. And then the cohort three states just get a few more months, about five more months um, to prepare their applications. So their applications are due in August and they get a 24 month pre-implementation period. So like the cohort two states would start in 2027 with their performance year. I should have noted this is limited to eight states or sub-state regions. Um, CMS only has funding and will only approve up to eight um, applications. And there does seem to be quite a lot of interest um, from states, not sure which cohorts or when, but um, there's definitely a lot of interest in this model. And it's a longer time frame: nine performance years for cohort one, eight for cohorts two and three. That's longer than previous models that we've seen. And seems that there's been some learning that taking additional time to implement these complex models is warranted. Next slide. Um, this really outlines the broad timeline for cohort one state. So in red, <laughs> our deadline is March 18th for applications to be provided by states. Um, CMS has indicated that they uh, anticipate that they'll award um, to states in, by May, sometime in May of 2024. And then that uh, implementation period um, would start in July and go through 2025 for cohort one states with that um, first performance year of January in 2026. So, you know, just want to put this out here because some of the work, you know, we're really focused right now on that March 18th deadline. There are some flexibilities for states that I'll get into in a moment that really, um, you know, we have longer time periods um, to, to address. Um, so. Next slide. This is a very busy slide. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I can come back to it at a future meeting. But um, the, the base slide here is CMSs, um, and they've laid out what they see as the operational milestones. We've, and this would be once a state has been accepted and decided to move forward with CMS on this model. And so we've put in some, you know, we've added the dates um, that we understand to be the deadlines for those cohort one states. So just wanted you to have a chance to see that, that again, um, you know, some of the decisions um, are well after the application period and would require um, acceptance into the model and subsequent negotiations. Next slide. And the next. So um, I am going to, um, 
you know, highlight sort of a format that I'm using here. The way that I've tried to share this information is that I wanted the board to have a sense of, you know, what is actually required in that application that um, is due on March 18th. And as I had mentioned earlier, they're really looking to see what's the state's capacity um, to implement the model. And then in addition, um, how does the state um, think about using that cooperative agreement funding of up to $12 million. So I'll go through this um, slide just to give you a sense of how they're thinking about this. And then on the subsequent slides, I'll skip over the details, but I just wanted you to see what's expected of us for the application. And I wanna spend a little time on what we believe are flexibilities in the model should we get accepted. So if this, um, this section of the draft narrative that we'll need to put together for an application really speaks to that statewide accountability. So again, looking at um, total cost of care measurement and growth, primary care investment, and then um, you know the um, some of the levers that we might use for being able to um, address the statewide accountability requirements. So you can see here that the application is asking us to describe our strategy for measuring statewide total cost of care and measuring primary care investment across payers over time. So they wanna see what's our ability to do that on a multi-payer or all-payer basis. Um, and they wanna know, you know what, what's our baseline? How are we doing currently um, on those measures? They want us to um, talk about how we will um, include targets for total cost of care and primary care investment. And they suggest three possible mechanisms for doing that. And you know, here they're really talking about codifying a process for establishing those targets. So state executive order is one mechanism, statute would be another, and regulation would be another way to um, codify those all-payer um, total cost of care, primary care investment mm -hmm. targets. They want to know how would we enforce it as well. Um, they want to they know how can we obtain the information that we need each year to measure um, results in those two areas um, from commercial payers and from Medicaid. I'll just um, give a nod to the board that the all-payer claims database is a um, nice uh, mechanism to have, um, even though it has, you know, some limitations. It's a great um, asset to us when responding to this. And then what are some of the policy levers that we might use to increase primary care spending by <laughs> commercial payers and by Medicaid? Um, and then similarly, um, what regulatory and policy levers could we use to achieve or enforce total cost of care growth targets um, across payers? And then finally, what are some of the gaps um, if we have them in how we report on total costs of, of care and primary care spending? So this is an example. This is one section of the NOFO. That's the kind of information that they're looking for. So next slide. This is where we think there's some flexibility um, in, you know, for discussion or negotiation with CMS um, in these statewide accountability areas. And you'll note the deadlines on the right. Again, they go be, you know, well beyond the um, the application submission. So while we're not focused on on this in the application it's top of mind for um, if we get accepted into the model. So a um, couple areas, one is that um, for mm -hmm. Medicare fee for service. So again, remember they're measuring total cost of care, primary care investment, quality and equity targets. They're um, 
measuring those both for Medicare fee for service and across all payers for states that are successful in the model. And so um, a couple of areas where we've um, gotten indications that there will be some flexibility is that when we calculate total cost of care for the Medicare fee for service population, um, the selection of baseline years and the weighting of baseline years, because the baseline year is really that start, that the baseline value is that starting point. And they've said they want to see three years in there, but which three years and how that's weighted, there does appear that there might be a little bit of flexibility. And then they also um, will build in a, a savings component. They want to see um, some savings or at least not, you know, they've said at least, you know, budget, what they call budget neutrality. And we think there's some flexibility there as well, particularly for low cost states like Vermont and also states like Vermont that have engaged in prior healthcare reform with CMS for Medicare and have shown savings. So um, we, we believe there's some flexibility there. And then um, calculation of primary care investment, the board, um, you know, a couple of years ago, did your report on primary care investment, um, worked with some other New England states on, you know, methodology there. Um, there's a lot of non-claims payments that are currently occurring in Vermont to primary care. And so one area of flexibility might be um, how those non-claims payments are handled because CMS has indicated they want to see them included. And then quality and equity targets, um, it looks like there'll be some flexibility there um, um, to include in the uh, in a state agreement if um, if we were to move forward with this model. And the state agreement really is that agreement between the state that has been selected and CMS. Um, other areas where we think there might be a little bit of flexibility, um, you know, I had mentioned sort of the executive order or statute or regulatory change to set those all payer total cost of care and primary care investment targets, you know, how we set that up and, and articulate that, we believe there's flexibility there. And the deadline for that is September 30th of 2025. And then um, the methodologies and targets, actually setting the targets for those um, measures, um, also, we believe um, that there will be some flexibility, and that does not have to occur until September 30th of 2026, so actually into the first performance year, um, we could still be setting targets there. Next slide. So I've pretty much laid things out in a similar fashion for the other um, areas of the application. I'm not going to go through it, um, but you know this lays out what does the application require for hospital global payments. I will highlight the full, uh, fifth row there. Um, we do need, um, in order for a state to apply, there needs to be at least one um, non-binding letter of intent from hospitals. Um, CMS is trying from a hospital. CMS is trying to understand, you know, it, how is the state engaging with hospitals and health systems about this potential model? And I think, as you know, we've um, we've been um, engaging quite a bit with um, hospitals and others on this um, model, and in particular on hospital global payments. I'll also just note that. Um, the application will require a detailed um, hospital recruitment plan as well. They want to see as many um, providers as possible in this model, and they have a particular interest in um, safety net providers such as critical access hospitals, um, federally qualified health centers, and rural health clinics. So they're really focused on um, how to support care um, for people um, that receive their care from safety net providers. Next slide. 
And then here are some, uh, you know, again, some flexibilities that um, that we appear to have with um, this model. The first and the most, um, you know, critical is that states that are like Vermont that um, have, you know, budget authority have prior experience with value-based care. They can design um, as their own state. Um, Medicare fee-for-service methodology for hospital global payments. Now they've outlined some principles and they need to, you know, there needs to be alignment there. And by the way, CMS will have to approve any state design methodology, but they are, um, they are um, willing to provide that, you know, to allow that flexibility and some tailoring for states that have that type of experience. For cohort one states, um, that real that methodology really would need to be submitted um, by July 1st of this year. Um, the reason is that it generally takes CMS about 18 months to to review and set up their systems to prepare for paying for services differently. Um, so that's why the 18 month, um, you know, uh, deadline there, 18 months ahead of performance year one. Couple other areas where um, we think there's some flexibility. Um, you know, what's the process for reviewing individual hospital requests for adjustments in their global budgets? Um, so for those hospitals that um, choose to participate, it would particularly pertain to whether there are changes in service lines, either they're providing additional services or not um, providing services any longer. And the deadline there is May 1st of 2025, so that it can be included in um, the agreement between the states and CMS. Um, a detailed Medicaid, hospital global payment methodology. Um, the requirement here um, and part of what makes us multi-payer is that CMS isn't just looking for a Medicare global payment model. They're also looking for Medicaid and eventually commercial as well. And so Medicaid would have to implement a global payment methodology sometime during 2026. And they would have to submit that detailed methodology to CMS um, by June 30th of 2025. So fair amount of flexibility there. Next slide. Um, this is the primary care um, ahead. So they ask in the application for a vision for primary care transformation and a plan for how primary care practices will be recruited to participate in primary care ahead. Um, a couple of pluses um, for uh, Vermont is that a lot of what they're looking for in terms of um, primary care transformation um, and, you know, payment uh, methods and so forth is, um, is we have that in the blueprint for health. It really um, aligns quite nicely with the blueprint for health. The thing with primary care is that for primary care practices to um, take advantage of the opportunity that, um, that Medicare is offering in the AHEAD model, they have to be participating in an advanced primary care model for Medicaid. Some states might not have a Medicaid advanced primary care model, others like Vermont do. And so, and most of our primary care practices, as you know, participate in the blueprint for health. And so um, we're in pretty good shape, it appears, on this particular aspect of the application. Next slide. And uh, so in terms of flexibilities in primary care ahead, um, I have outlined a couple um, that appear to be in the model. Um, I, I couldn't quite tease out the deadlines here. So I assume that it means that this will be worked into the state agreement, which they wanna see negotiated by May 1st 
of 2025 for cohort one states and then executed by um, July 1st. So they have said that they'll require five measures for primary care practices that um, want to participate in the AHEAD bottle. And they've outlined um, specific measures. However, they have said um, that if a state um, wants to propose an alternative measure um, to align, you know, maybe we're using it in our Medicaid advanced primary care model, um, that they will consider that, but it has to, they outline some domains and I'll, um, I'll share those with you, but they, they, they want to make sure that the measures are, you know, comparable to the measures that they've suggested and that they support the model's goals. So that's one area of um, potential, albeit limited, flexibility. And then another is that there might be an opportunity um, the under the primary care head model, CMS is prepared to offer practices enhanced primary care payments. They're saying that will average um, $17 per member per month, um, no less than $15, no more than 21, but in that range. And um, they're gonna risk adjust based on the population um, in the practice. And so there seems to be some indication that there might be some flexibility around what tool they use to risk adjust a practice's population. They want to pay more for practices that are serving vulnerable populations. So those are a couple of areas of flexibility in the primary care model. Next slide. Um, model governance and health equity. The um, the model, you know, we have to outline, um, do we have existing structures that we could use to help build a model governance structure? Um, you know, how will we identify folks, so forth. And then there's um, quite a focus um, in this model on health equity. So they wanna know what is the state currently doing in the area of health equity. And we've got um, quite a lot going on, including at the health department um, and how um, we can um, leverage those activities to um, improve performance. Um, and they wanna see um, some activity focused on um, identifying health-related social needs, addressing them, reducing health disparities. So they wanna see, it's kind of a current state. Um, what, are, what are we doing now in these arenas? Next slide. And so there's some, you know, really quite a bit of flexibility. There's some requirements, but um, they wanna, um, you know, know how we're going to, um, set up a model governance structure within their guidelines and the deadline there appears to be um, around November 1st of this year for cohort one states. And then um, one of the key tasks of the model governance group is to establish a statewide health equity plan and that needs to be done um, by December 31st of 2025. Um, so just before the um, first performance year um, for the cohort one states. Next slide. Commercial payer alignment. Um, you may recall that in the model by the second performance year, there needs to be at least one commercial plan um, under hospital global budgets. And so this outlines in the application um, again, sort of what's current state um, commercial payer participation in, um, in uh, care delivery reform and value-based payment programs and, you know, other sort of readiness um, activities. And then is there authority um, to support or facilitate commercial payer participation in the global budgets um, and, um, you know, some other requirements there. Next slide. 
And so for um, flexibility, again, the timing of commercial payer participation, um, any time from model inception, but it must be done by January 1st of 2027. And then um, there would need to be a hospital global budget methodology for commercial payers. And, uh, you know, there's no firm deadline outlined, but um, just logically thinking about how long it takes to make the changes, again, the systems, so forth. Um, I put in a date of Q4 2025 at the latest to have a methodology outlined for commercial payers. Next slide. Um, this uh, speaks to health information technology infrastructure. And again, they're really looking to see what's our capacity um, in terms of data and HIT to support uh, the model and its implementation. Next slide. And there's not really, um, I didn't notice any flexibilities around the HIT. They're really just um, looking to see how we're doing. So um, this slide speaks to the cooperative agreement funding. Remember that's at up to $12 million that they are prepared to give states that are um, selected. And so, um, you know, they've, they've outlined intended uses um, so recruiting primary care providers and hospitals to participate, um, you know, the technical work of setting those total cost of care growth and primary care investment targets. Um, they specifically call out building mental health and substance use disorder infrastructure and capacity um, and supporting Medicaid and commercial payer alignment across the model. So those are, you know, very broad um, implementation supports. And within the NOFO, they have asked for a very detailed budget and um, narrative to accompany that budget. And one, you know, one of the requirements seems obvious, but that the requested funding must be reasonable. And then in in addition, they want to see a sustainability plan because really this cooperative agreement funding is intended more for one time or short term activities. Um, they want to make sure that the work that's underway can be sustained after that funding goes away. The $12 million would be available for the first five and a half to six years of the model, depending on which cohort a state it's in. So it's not ongoing throughout the duration of the model. Next slide. Um, this goes into a little more detail about examples of how the funds could be used. So it could be state agency staff, it could be new technology, um, integration of community services referrals. Um, you, know, you know, because of the focus on health equity, um, supporting demographic data collection um, is going to be important to the model. Um, you know, bolstering uh, HIE, you know, clinical data collection and creating dashboards for providers, supporting population health activities, that's very broad. Um, implementing health-related social needs screening and referrals, um, and development of both those, you know, the Medicaid hospital global budget, but also commercial hospital global budget methodologies. And then any, you know, here's the all other, but any other aspects that align with a population health agenda. So these are examples, um, but you can see sort of their, you know, what they're seeing as priorities. Next slide. I think I've only got two more slides. So, um, you know, the, um, I wanted to just, I know there's some interest in the quality strategy and while we don't, you know, have to have things locked down for the application, I wanted you to get a sense of what CMS is thinking. 
So in the NOFO, they talk about, you know, the quality strategy needs to have three sets of quality measures, and they all have to have a health equity focus. So there's a statewide measures that's part of that statewide accountability. Um, primary care, as I mentioned, there need to be five um, primary care measures for those practices that participate in the model, and then hospital quality programs as well. And CMS has outlined four domains, um, areas of interest for them, um, prevention and wellness, um, population health, mental health and substance use disorder, <clears throat> and healthcare quality and utilization. And there's um, goals, and in a way, they can be seen as examples of the types of measures that they'll be looking for in each of those four domains. Next slide. So we, um, you know, in our discussions and our technical groups and so forth, we've, um, you know, sort of taken it a little further. We, um, there are the federal and state accountability targets. There's a hospital level, there's the primary care. But we also believe that as part of this model, it'll be imperative that there's broader monitoring and evaluation, um, just to make sure that there aren't unintended consequences um, that we're measuring in areas that are of high interest, for example, um, you know, uh, access to care, um, care delivery, you know, trends and utilization and so forth. So, um, you know, we've sort of started that discussion, but that's going to be really important to the model. And then, as always is the case with, with quality and performance measurement, you know, to the extent that we can have alignment um, across these areas, across payers, it can really help um, align incentives for the people who are actually um, providing the care and doing the work, and it can limit administrative burden. So I think that might be my last slide. Yeah. Thank you for listening. I, um, I feel like that was a lot of material. I might have no voice left tonight for the PCAG meeting, but we'll see. So. All right, good afternoon. Do we post for questions for Pat or should I continue? Um, why don't we keep on keep on moving on, Shule, and we can just do questions all together. Unless Pat, do you do you need to leave or do you mind sticking around? What's your preference, nope. Pat? I'll be happy to stick around. Thank you. Okay. All right. We'll hold we'll hold them. Good afternoon, and you can hear me well, I assume. Uh so um, thank you for this opportunity, and um, I also want to thank the state staff, GMCB staff, and the TAG members who really worked with us um, continuously in the last 12 months or so to get to a place where we are today. Um, so what I will be doing um, in this presentation is to recap some of the great information Pat shared, focusing on hospital global budget. Next slide, please. And then kind of start building the way that we've been discussing global payment program in Vermont with our stakeholders and thinking through what ahead requirements are and where um, the um, state may want to take the global budget uh, payment mechanisms for the head application and beyond. Um, as Pat mentioned, um, AHEAD has multiple levers and multiple components. Um, there's a lot there and she did a great job uh, summarizing all of it. Um, and I, my easy job is really focus on one box here, which is the hospital global budgets, uh, which from the AHEAD perspective includes only hospital facility payments. So these are part A and part B in the Medicare um, beneficiary um, uh, structure and it only includes payments made to the hospitals. It doesn't include any professional services associated with those uh, utilization. Next slide, please. 
Um, the way that the AHEAD is setting up the global budget is they are visioning to have separate global payments for each payer type. Um, so CMS is providing an option uh, for the Medicare fee for service side to create a state designated methodology. Um, that means state is going to have flexibilities, but they need to meet certain alignment criteria set forward in the AHEAD application or CMS is going to design and implement a kind of a standard methodology under the Medicare fee-for-service budget. Uh, for Medicaid budget, state Medicaid agency is responsible creating the methodology. And again, there are some alignment criteria that CMS is expecting states to meet. Um, and on the commercial payer, uh, including Medicare Advantage, um, as Pat mentioned, at least one commercial payer must participate, uh, but the requirements for commercial and Medicare Advantage methodology is much higher level, um, and, um, and the states are, again, in charge of developing the uh, commercial methodology as well. So from, from this overview, Vermont has two options um, on the Medicare fee-for-service side. Um, Vermont could design their own version of global payment, or they could sign up to the standard uh, CMS methodology for Medicare fee-for-service. Um, not every state has this option. Um, reflecting on Pat's presentation, you know, the list of problems that we are dealing with is kind of similar across the board in the nation. Vermont has very unique challenges, uh, but Vermont also has very unique capabilities that could address and create solutions. And in this case, with the rate setting authority for provider prices, as well as the um, Green Mountain Care Board and AHS infrastructure, Vermont may qualify for uh, creating um, its own methodology and uh, because of the experience uh, the state has as well as the infrastructure that they have. Um, another thing to point out is that the AHEAD is kind of designed with um, lessons learned from pr prior state learning. So Vermont, Maryland and Pennsylvania are mentioned in the NOFO as uh, the example states and the models that the, the CMS um, kind of draw lessons from. So uh, we, do, we do think that the Vermont has a, a very strong um, positioning here. The Medicare requirements, as Pat mentioned, I just want to reiterate, not all hospitals have to be under global payment mechanism. Uh, to meet the AHEAD requirements, it will only include 10% of the overall Medicare fee for service spending in, in first year, and then you would need to increase it up to 30% by year four. Um, so it's a voluntary program for all payers um, with the targets that needs to be met uh, by the recruitment efforts uh, from the state side. Next slide, please. Um, so this is another uh, way of looking at the times and deadlines that Pat mentioned. Um, I did notice that Pat is thinking June 30th and I'm thinking July 1st. So if you are detailed oriented, there might be a month difference, but it's only a couple day difference in the way the timeline set up. The important thing is if Vermont chooses to go with its own methodology, um, we need to submit the preliminary budget methods uh, by July 2024. Uh, that also includes the Medicaid uh, proposals as well. Um, but obviously, Medicaid has a longer timeline to get the regulatory approvals. Uh, but by January 2025, we need to have the final methodology established and hospitals would need to sign up to the new payment program by October 2025. And all the programs are scheduled uh, according to the cohort one timeline to start in January 2026. Next slide, please. So we do have some time. We don't need to mention much in the NOFO re related to methodology details, but after the NOFO, if we were to be picked, then there is really a short period of time to submit that initial uh, proposal for global budgets. So before I get to details, I want to kind of take one step back and think about the global payment model uh, and why um, why states are interested in moving in that direction, why hospitals and, and payers are interested in this. The ideas behind global payment model is really to move the system from fee-for-service payment model to a fixed revenue model, where in the current model, 
um, in Vermont, we do have um, ACO fixed payments already um, that are impacting the care delivery. Medicaid has the fixed payments, uh, but commercials are mostly on the fee for service side and the incentives, underlying incentives are still remaining to be higher payment rates, higher utilizations from the business model perspective. Um, and, and the focus in service delivery then is uh, if you want to keep the doors open, you have to focus on high margin uh, services uh, and there might be some um, contradictory incentives there with the community needs versus what is the high margin services um, that hospitals have to offer to keep the, the, the doors open. And you all are very familiar with this dynamic given your uh, budget review process. Under global payment model, um, so you could consider that as a tool and the way you apply it will determine the results. Um, so it could bolster the um, incentives to change delivery. Um, it could bolster sustainability of the hospital finances. Uh, but the idea is, is that um, the revenues are set prospectively ahead of time. So the payment amounts are determined prospectively and those payments are paid uh, through a monthly or um, some other schedule so that it is a guaranteed revenue for the hospitals with the policies determined ahead of time. Um, and over time, this revenue is updated with, again, um, using several um, adjustments that reflects inflation and membership change and maybe other changes like service line changes uh, that we are going to get into more detail. So it doesn't mean that it is a constant number over time. It is prospectively calculated, uh, uh, but also it is a guaranteed revenue from the hospital perspective. Uh, so they are getting that revenue um, as, as a payment amount. Next slide, please. Um, I'm glad um, I, I also picked up from Pat's presentation. What is the goal? We should start there and then figure out how to get there. So um, this is why it's backwards. The, the, the first left part is that where we want to go, where, what are we trying to do um, in this? And payment system is, again, a, a vehicle, right? So by itself, it's not the goal to change the payment. What we are trying to do is to um, improve delivery and, and really support the transformation in, in the system. And the transformation here is um, about lowering the uh, avoidable utilization. So we have the capacity to do better services, right care, right time at the right place. Um, so that entails shifting the balance in our resources away from um, kind of creating incentives to reduce avoidable utilization and invest those resources into more population health essential services. So changing that balance in our system from sick care to prevention and wellness care. Um, in the global budget payment mechanism, um, we bring the financial incentives, so the business model would need to change, uh, but also um, to accomplish these goals, uh, there needs to be additional support on the transformation side, and AHEAD has some of those components with operational flexibilities uh, that we could get from CMS on the Medicare side, uh, data systems, infrastructure investments, as well as alignment around performance measures to be clear what we measuring, what we are monitoring, and how those measures are impacting provider payments. Next slide, please. All right, so I mentioned the tag already. Um, so um, the charge of the advisory group was to help us to think through the key components of the global payment um, methodology and um, and we met since January, so it's been more than a year, and uh, we are going to have one more meeting to at least one more meeting um, to kind of do the comparison with AHEAD and what we've been working towards. Um, again, I would like to thank everyone who participated in the TAG, as well as hospitals, payers, and the Office of Healthcare Advocate who had additional meetings with us to really unpack some of these complicated questions with us. Um, so what I'm going to present in the next couple of slides is incorporating their feedback. Um, and, and But as you're going to see, there are still a lot of decisions and questions to be um, asked and, and decided. Next slide, please. 
Um, so there is an alignment in the way that we reach to kind of have to construct the global payments. Um, we will be looking at separate uh, global payments by payer. Um, so here um, the tag focused on the Medicare side, and this is going to be my focus as well. Um, and Medicaid is working their own global budget payment methodology, and we're working on aligning um, certain aspects to it. Um, and then for the commercial payers, um, the vision for the global payment is to create this payment at the payer company level and have adjustments for different markets for their ASO fully insured and Medicare Advantage plans. They're all going to come together to create a one single payment uh, from each commercial payer who would be subject to or who would be participating in this model. And the considerations here are um, um, even though the ahead requirements are smaller for a system wide change, obviously you have to have a um, larger portion of the hospital revenue under a similar methodology. Uh, so there is a balance between increasing the participation with incentives and creating that um, overall transformation that we are seeking under this, this model. Uh, the, as you can imagine, commercial market is quite dynamic and complicated. So uh, that's the, another reason why we focused on the CMS first. Uh, but we are actively thinking about how we can take some of those uh, methodologies and adapt it to commercial payers um, as well. Next slide, please. Um, from the hospital revenue streams perspective, um, we started with the facility payments, um, and this is aligning with the head minimum requirements. Um, the facility payments for hospital inpatient, hospital swing beds, and outpatient departments. Um, in terms of the phase two, as you see here, there is a big interest in including professional services, uh, professionals billing under hospital 10, so owned by hospitals, um, and that goes into the hospital revenue stream. So we bucketed as phase two, um, mainly because of the data limitations and additional considerations that we need to make on the professional services side. Um, on the exclusion side, uh, you do see that the patient portion, so the coinsurance co-pays, will be excluded from the global payment. Um, this is the uh, Kind of, if you think about the mechanics, um, the global payment is going to pay, be paid by CMS, and the patients will continue to pay their own share based on their own utilizations. Um, on the other operating revenue, um, we are not going to be changing the way um, the other revenues uh, come to the hospital. So these examples are. Uh, dish payments, uh, GME payments, um, and any retail pharmacy that the hospital owns that is outside of the medical uh, benefits that the individuals have. You do see um, a quick a table here just to understand the percent of the revenue excluded, um, and you do see that it is um, about 13% in 2022, and it's actually declining, so uh, it seemed to me that the more um, included revenue is going to be, uh, if the trend continues, uh, you know, we don't have an issue about excluded revenues kind of growing disproportionately uh, compared to the included revenues. Next slide, please. Uh, from the board's perspective, um, you have an established process to do budget reviews for each hospital every year. And in this um, table, um, we try to explain where the budget review happens and where the global payment is going to come. So the budget review focuses on NPR, uh, net patient revenues, and fixed prospective payments. So that's the overall revenue of the hospital from the patients. As we continue to build our global payment revenues in this table, the maximum amount that we have is around 70%. So this includes 26% uh, of Medicare fee-for-service revenue uh, that drew ahead we could include in the global payment. It does include Medicaid, assuming that Medicaid is going to include all their revenues under global payment. And on the commercial, as you see, it's a potential. We do not expect all commercial payers to participate. Um, you know, at minimum, some of these commercial payers are quite small. 
uh, right? So uh, there will be challenges for them to create a global payment and change their practices. So we are still working on what is the um, uh, potential for commercial payers to participate in a global payment program. So at maximum, um, you know, the 70% of the net patient revenue may potentially be under global payment model. Next slide. All right, so we covered what is included, what is um, kind of potentially from the hospital side, what percent revenue, and now we're going to go through how do you construct the global payment um, over time. Um, the step one is determining baseline revenues. Here uh, we are going to start with historical payments um, and then we'll go through additional adjustments in a minute. Uh, once you have that baseline revenue, we need to think about on an annual basis, what are the factors that we need to take into account to update those baseline revenues? Um, and once they are done, the decisions are how do you pay it during the year? Um, step four is what happens if there is something happening in mid-year, even though we did the prospective calculations, what are the scenarios where there might be a potential update or adjustment uh, to those payments amounts? Um, you know, COVID, we are still kind of aftermath of the COVID impact. You can think about a scenario where uh, utilization really went up. There is a crisis or some sort. Obviously, the fixed payments may not be sufficient temporarily to cover the cost of those additional services, or uh, there would be dips that you may want to think about as well from the payer perspective. And finally, um, as you finish the first year of implementation, uh, what will be the trend factors that we would like to use for the subsequent years? Here is an example is year two. So those are the key steps and key decisions that we need to make as we create the global payment model. Next slide, please. All right, so first step is the based on payments. Um, so again, focusing on Medicare fee for service only uh, for um, Medicare budgets, um, this aligns with AHEAD as well, um, that we are including the amounts from the claims. Um, so this will include Part D payments, which is the retail pharmacy. It will exclude beneficiary co-pays, and then it will exclude any payments that were made outside of the claims. Um, so these will be the baselines, and we are looking at a three-year time period. If we start in 2026, uh, you see the baseline years as fiscal years 2022, 2023, and 2024. As uh, Pat mentioned, there is some flexibility in determining the baselines and the weights, uh, but we thought that we would start with the ahead um, as it seemed like a, an alignment uh, to begin with uh, from the historical revenue perspective. Next slide. In terms of the step two, um, as we update the payments, uh, these what we call standard payments are uh, general kind of adjustments across the board for all hospitals participating in the model. Um, there is the inflationary adjustment, beneficiary changes, uh, policy changes, and performance uh, updates, and I'm going to go through them in more detail in a minute. And then we do describe additional adjustments. So if a hospital, so these are more, uh, I would say, one-on-one -on -one adjustments, so not all hospitals may get this. You know, it depends on whether they are making changes to their service lines. Uh, whether there are market shifts happening in the market. And then we also um, kind of discussed hospital specific payments um, for um, tertiary care, for example, um, the tag and um, the leads we worked on creating additional adjustment for tertiary care. And we are working on creating special considerations for safety net hospitals. So you see a lot of acronyms here, but critical access hospitals, uh, safety net hospitals, um, sole community hospitals, uh, and Medicare dependent hospitals. So depending on their nature of the provider type, um, there will be uh, specific adjustments to account for different factors that these hospitals face. Next slide, please. Uh, so once we do those adjustments, um, CMS is going to be paying on um, uh, 26 payments. Um, so they are going to stop paying claims uh, and they are going to start writing checks. 
hospitals will still submit the claims uh, so we could do calculations. Uh, but at the end of the day, payment is going to be a regular salary uh, for hospitals, if you will, um, rather than depending on the ups and downs of the claim payments. Next slide. And on the mid-year updates, um, we propose to have these ad hoc and reserved for very unique circumstances um, so that we keep the premise of prospective, sustainable, and predictable revenue. So as you can imagine, mid-year updates could um, create unpredictability. Um, so we will, we are creating this very limited scenarios and reserving this uh, for major disruptions in financial flows or services or exogenous factors. Next slide. So at the end of the year, uh, it's time to update and calculate the next year's budget uh, payment. Um, here, um, learning from the prior experience where the settlements and reconciliations back to fee for service creates major barriers um, in implementation and kind of reduces some of the incentives uh, that we would like to have, uh, we propose no retrospective settlement under global payment. Um, so all the adjustments will be calculated for the next year's global payment, so there won't be any settlement process related to year one, but the year two budget will be updated. Am I going too fast? Should I slow down? Okay. Um, same sort of adjustments again. So now we're going to look at the future year um, adjustments for standards as well as the additional adjustments. So everything is updated for one year. Uh, there will be different numbers, but the methodologies will be the same year over year for updating the global budget payment. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so that's kind of the step. So again, I'm going to take you one more level detail and I have a few slides left to kind of now taking a step back and thinking through what are the considerations for each step. So for the historical revenue, um, you know, validation of the payment if amounts and clarifying what is in, what is not in is going to be a key focus uh, for the state, no matter which option the state chooses, whether it's the CMS standard or Vermont. Um, the uniqueness in Vermont is that uh, we need to think about how CMS will continue to pay for Blueprint, CHD, and SASH. Um, so that's going to be an ongoing conversation and potentially uh, something to clarify um, during the pre-implementation phase. Um, there will be additional adjustments. So um, if you think about the three-year baseline, a lot of things may have changed. And if a hospital closed a service or opened a service, we want to make sure that we align the historical revenues. Um, so the starting point for a hospital is kind of reflecting their current service line um, offerings. Um, next slide, please. Based on incentives, um, in the CMS methodology, uh, CMS is offering an upward adjustment of a 1% to fund transformation activities. This incentive is available only in performance year one and performance year two. The goal here is, in addition to provide additional services, you can think about this as an additional incentive to join the program early. If a hospital joins in performance year three, they are going to be missing out of this additional 1% in the CMS methodology. As we discussed the potential incentives or baseline adjustments with the TAG members, we came up with a few additional considerations for Vermont to think about, given the focus on improving access and also investing in health equity. Um, so we listed them here. Um, you know, there is a consideration to provide additional revenue in the baseline uh, for um, hospitals serving the most disadvantaged populations. Uh, there might be upfront investments needed for targeted areas for access related. And after me, I understand we'll hear a little bit more about that work um, to understand the needs. Um, there was also a discussion about, uh, you know, as we build this from the historical revenues and if the hospital con con continuously have a negative margin, how is the hospital going to change the financial picture of the um, 
of the institution under global budget payment. Um, so there was some consideration about whether we should make additional adjustments as one time uh, to get them to a uh, acceptable level from the start with. And there could be exception based factors on a case by case basis and CMS methodology actually has that as well. Um, that also opens up maybe unique circumstances uh, that we may need to make adjustments to the baselines as well. Obviously, um, we could come up with many more and um, the important thing here is. Um, do we have how much funding we have to invest in the baseline and that will be driven by. Uh, the requirements at the statewide on Medicare savings or Medicare trends. So um, these are all options um, at the end. The final decisions I suspect would depend on where the state ends uh, with the um, CMS ahead savings requirements to go back and, and figure out what it is that we could invest at the at the beginning of this model. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to the size, so um, I I think the variation between hospitals. Another consideration is, um, you know, how unique this um, funding is going to be based on the circumstances of each hospital. Uh, the one percent transformation incentive is our understanding, at least currently, is going to be one percent to all hospitals participating, regardless of their. Um, situation, I would say, uh, but you may consider, you know, variations between hospitals, um, given more funding for hospitals serving most disadvantaged population is a good example, as opposed to giving a 1% across the board to all hospitals. Um, the another consideration here is, um, you know, cost efficiency, financial stability. Uh, there might be some balances there um, if the um, if the eventual model has the sustainability adjustment, uh, taking into account uh, some of the margins that I mentioned in the earlier options. On the um, time period side, as I mentioned, um, CMS is in vision is to use this as incentives to join the program early. Um, if the state creates its own model, um, is it going to be for two years, three years? Um, and, and whether um, there will be payback if the hospital leaves the program in mid-year. So there is an option that ho any hospital could leave the program um, since this is a voluntary uh, program and CMS does have some clauses if the hospital leaves early that they would have to pay back the transformation plans. Uh, payments, excuse me. And finally, on the accountability side, um, there is a language in the head that hospitals would need to submit transformation plans. How much you want to tie the baseline incentives to some of those plans or actual changes on the ground is again a, another consideration uh, that we need to work out as we build the methodology together. Next slide, please. Um, one of the requirements of the head is to make adjustments based on health equity. Um, global payments will be adjusted based on the social risk of the patients. Um, and um, we do not know what CMS is planning to do in this area, but I'm teeing this up and it will link with our health equity measure sets as well um, that uh, we will be looking at this a little bit more closely in the coming months. Um, and the prior comments from the tag is that um, there is a general support in this concept, uh, but the measures and the tools might be very complicated. And uh, we may start with a, a progression plan. If we have a, a desired goal, we may not get there in the year one, and it may build up um, eventually starting with the measure itself, collecting an additional information, supporting data collection, and, and move to a payment adjustment um, in year three and four as well. Next slide, please. All right, um, so those are all baseline, how much uh, we could do in the baseline revenue calculations. Now I'm gonna briefly touch about the adjustments. Um, I did list the uh, standard adjustments here. Um, I'm not going to go through them in detail, uh, but the idea is that to uh, provide the sufficient updates every year, accounting for changes happening outside 
of the hospital, as well as uh, paying for performance, right? Paying for outcomes as the last point. Next slide, please. The proposal for inflation adjustment is to use CMS hospital market basket. Um, uh, that is the number that CMS uses for their own hospitals. Uh, we do not know what they're going to use for a head model yet, uh, but our starting point is to use the update factor that they use every year, um, and it will be kind of projected um, by the actuaries and uh, we could use that number um, as an our inflationary adjustment here you see the graphic um, we all know the um, increase in inflation in in the um, prior years 2023 and 2022 you do see that the eventually the the trend picks up uh, but there is a risk here that with forecast uh, we may not pick up everything that may happen during that year um, critical access hospitals and Medicare dependent hospitals may need additional considerations as um, their cost structures are different and the uh, average number that is calculated across all the PPS hospitals may not be sufficient for them. Next slide. On the beneficiary adjustments, so we addressed the cost and now we are thinking about people served. On people served, um, we do need to make adjustments based on their risk profile. Um, so as you know, as we get older, um, we spend more on healthcare. Um, so age, gender, and ESRD status for Medicare beneficiaries will be taken into account. Um, and that we will distribute the beneficiary growth to each hospital uh, based on their um, revenue from each HSA. So we are uh, proposing to do this at the hospital or health service area and calculating the membership change and allocating that membership change after adjustments based on the hospital's revenue from each HSA. Next slide, please. On the policy and performance adjustments, um, we propose to use CMS policy adjustments, so this should align with AHEAD as well. Um, and AHEAD is also requiring a quality adjustment. We could ask for a waiver um, not to use the CMS programs, uh, but the proposed initial proposal is to start with CMS and move towards creating an all-payer quality program during the implementation period. Um, there are additional performance adjustments that, that would be happening under global payment, and those are total cost of care accountability, improvements in health disparities and efficiency, which I'm going to get in a minute. Next slide, please. If Pat gave you a lot of information, I'm giving you even more and uh, more detail, um, so I'm happy to um, kind of take questions at the end if you want to get into more detail. Uh, but, you know, we talked about the transformation incentives being only two years. Um, there is also the opposite that some of these adjustments are going to start in year four or year five. So I want you guys to focus more on the health equity improvement bonus on the CMS methodology. It's starting in year four. As a payment adjustment um, and the TCOC performance adjustment is also starting in year four um, and effectiveness adjustment is starting in year two. So CMS made decisions on when and how these adjustments would start. If Vermont chooses to do their own options, then these are all going to be discussed and decided on the methodology as well. Next slide, please. So on the Total cost of care accountability. This is a requirement if the state does their own methodology. And the, um, the requirement is that um, we need to create a methodology if the state does not meet the Medicare fee for service state accountability. So if we don't have enough savings, basically, we need to create a methodology where we can link that performance back to the hospital global payment. That's the requirement uh, for um, the total cost accountability. CMS also indicated that the initial transformation incentives and additional payments for primary care will be excluded from this. Again, in the standard methodology, 
Um, there is some variation in terms of the timing, uh, but Vermont could also think about which payments will be excluded from the total cost of accountability as we design this methodology in more detail. The, in addition to the CMS requirements, if we can create a, a, an accountability this way, um, the physicians working with the hospitals could qualify for additional incentives and payments from CMS. Um, and also it is um, aligning the, the work with the total cost of care. So not only just putting a levers around hospital payments, uh, but linking the payment to a total cost, even though uh, there is a limited impact uh, from the hospital's perspective to non-hospital providers uh, from the beginning. Um, next slide, please. You know, creating a, a total cost accountability on hospital is also complicated. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here is that um, CMS is requiring a geographic attribution. So we are not going to attribute patients to hospitals. We have to figure out how we can do and assign certain geographies uh, to each hospital. And there are multiple options here, and we'll be working and looking at CMS methodology um, to understand what their requirement is to see if we can adapt this to the Vermont uh, methodology. Next slide, please. Um, so finally, on the additional adjustments, um, you know, the service line is a big one. Um, how do we handle if hospital is changing services and the hospital specific uh, adjustments are uh, to, to a certain extent related, uh, but has their own separate considerations. So I'm going to go quickly on those two. Um, next slide, please. The service line, um, you know, we are thinking about four scenarios. Uh, one is how do we fund new and expanded services? Uh, because they are no longer going to be paid on fee for service. So we have to prospectively adjust the global payment. Um, what do we do when they close or reduce services? Um, the idea here is that as we are removing the uh, margin question out and incentivizing them to shift services, um, do we need to take all the payments out from the historical revenue if a hospital is doing the right thing and closing a service that the community doesn't need anymore? Um, the third option is temporary changes. Um, if they hire you know, if they need to hire a new physician for a retired physician, we know that it's a temporary dip, uh, but we may need to think about how long we want to keep that as um, budget neutral uh, before we go and make adjustments to global payments. Uh, and then finally, um, to create the incentives and maintain high quality of care, um, we do want to think about whether uh, we do want to make adjustments if the patients shift from one hospital to the other. And here is the, the way we are thinking about market shifts is that if a hospital you know, gains or provides more services on the inpatient side, we do want to see declines in another hospital for us to be able to assess and adjust the global payments. So we maintain that overall budget neutrality um, in the global pay, budget payment program. Um, we did do some development work on the tertiary care services. Um, the goal here is to um, adjust the global payment based on the changes in high cost services. Um, and this is a unique to Vermont. Um, this, this, this didn't come up in the ahead. Uh, they do have different concepts. They are trying to do outlier adjustments um, and exception based. Um, so this could be something we can consider as well. Uh, but the way um, that we have developed this in this straw model is to um, come up with a list of services where um, we create a reconciliation process, so to speak, uh, to adjust the global payments up and down, downward or upward based on the utilization in tertiary care. And this will only apply to UVM and one or two more hospitals, depending on how we define tertiary care. Next slide, please. And finally, um, we are kind of on the hospital side. We are watching what CMS is going to do for critical access hospitals and Medicare dependent hospitals. Um, they are 
they clarified that um, they do not plan to reconcile critical access hospitals back to the cost report, which is a major change for critical access hospitals and a big issue in Vermont, given the hospitals that you have. Um, we want to understand what CMS is envisioning. Um, they do have some adjustments already to um, help critical access hospitals on the quality adjustment program, as well as the performance measures. As I said, they sometimes start late or they have only upward adjustment. Um, and they do mention there might be a concept of floor um, that you know the payments will cover certain fixed costs for these hospitals um, and that there might be some sufficiency. So those are all undefined terms in the ahead. Um, for expediency and the timing perspective, um, we are waiting for their definitions to see if we can adapt those and modify them if needed uh, for the Vermont methodology. All right, I have two more and then we are done. So those are all the things that we discussed and worked through in the last 12 months. We did see a few things that didn't come up in our discussions, uh, but worth mentioning here for your consideration. Uh, next slide is um, the health equity improvement bonus. Uh, we did discuss this a little bit, but we didn't really formalize it in the straw model. Uh, but CMS is going to provide a, a bonus, an upward adjustment, if the hospital uh, perform on certain quality measures that are related to health disparities. So that's the first one. Next one is an effectiveness adjustment. Um, this is a downward adjustment and CMS is going to be looking at potentially avoidable utilization and uh, reducing the global payments um, based on the progress made on, on these measures. Again, um, it's starting in performance year two and the costs are gonna start in performance year three. The measures that they are using is in the next slide. Um, in terms of avoidable utilization. Uh, they do not define them yet. Uh, they mention them as examples. Um, readmissions, um, ambulatory care sensitive inpatient admissions, emergency department visits are what they consider as avoidable utilization. Um, they also mention um, overuse or low value care uh, measures and I put some examples here. Um, so all of these measures are driven from claims analyses and there are specific algorithms uh, developed or vetted by national organizations. And I did provide some detail if you are interested in the appendix for each of these measures. All right. Um, we are ending in the same slide as Pat. Um, you know, at the end, as we develop the methodology, uh, from my perspective, um, we have a clear link between all three, but more importantly, which measures we want to make payment adjustments, which measures we want to put in the monitoring plan, plan is an important factor to consider. So uh, there might be broader sets for monitoring and those measures may eventually get to a payment model. Um, but there will be a link and assessment in both of those uh, from the alignment perspective to ensure uh, that we have the incentives balance in the global payments. So, and more to come on, on those measure sets and, and the way that we are going to be linking that with the statewide um, selection of the measures as well. Um, so with that, I think I, and I ended here. Great. Um, why don't we take a six minute break and come back at 240 and then we'll have board members questions and comments, uh, HCA and public comments. So we'll see you at 240. Thank you. OK, looks like we have everyone here so we can resume our hearing. Um, I'll open up to the board members for any questions or comments that they may have for um, Shule or Pat. I can jump in if you want, uh, Chair Foster. Sure, great. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much. There's so much to digest here, and and I know there's a lot of um, hard work and stakeholder engagement and modeling efforts that have gone on behind the scenes for a year plus. 
to get us to this point. And I really appreciate that. And I want to say, I think this is an intriguing model that I'm really glad is under serious consideration. I think there's a lot to, to uh, like about it. Um, I think most of my questions may be more directed to you, Pat, um, and are probably closer to the top of the de decision tree. Um, in terms of, I think of the decision tree ahead or no ahead, and then if ahead, what is what does the global budget look like under there? That what does the model look like under there? That's going to be best for Vermonters. So, I think today a little bit as as I'm just trying to get a sense um, of the analysis that we need to do to make sure that ahead is best for Vermont compared to the next best alternative. So really trying to understand what what happens if we don't do ahead. What does that look like? What fee for service version are we in? Um, and then how do we compare the two worlds on a, on a couple of different dimensions? Um, and I just want to preface by saying, uh, I know that the NOFO app is just a preliminary kind of non-binding step, which I totally agree we should submit. And um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that we are submitting it because it allows us to have this conversation with the federal government. I'm just more thinking about what are the types of analysis that I think would be helpful to see before the state signs any final agreement, or perhaps as we go into negotiations around what that agreement looks like. So most of my questions, like I said, are a little bit more 40,000 foot today than, you know, 5,000 feet about the intricacies of the global budget model, which I think I will have questions and and I like a lot of what I see there. Um, so one of the, I think I'm going to back up a bit and when I think about the challenges that our health system faces right now, and I think about, you know, obviously affordability of health care. I think about it for the uninsured, the underinsured, the employers, the school districts. Everybody is trying to pay pre premiums right now. I think of really long wait times for specialty care. I think of insufficient access to primary care. I think of patients boarding in the ED because there's no mental health beds or inpatients ready for discharge, but there's nowhere for them to go because there's not enough sniff beds. These are the things that I think are, are acute challenges that we face. And so when I start to think about the AHEAD model, I imagine how will this model impact those very, very specific uh, issues relative to that next best alternative of probably some fee-for-service. So um, one of the questions I guess I have for you, Pat, is I, I, this, this model is certainly designed um, to curb healthcare costs, specifically for Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and, it, and it looks, you know, has promised to do that. I'm interested in thinking about, you know, the balloon analogy that sometimes I give, right? If you squeeze on one end, does it pop out the other end? And so I'm wondering, are there plans to try and model what's likely to happen to commercial insurance premiums under a head versus under that next best alternative? So I guess that's my first question. Then I've got a couple others related to that, but. Great. Um Thank you, Dr. Holmes. There's a lot. Um, there's actually several questions embedded in there, I think. <laughs> and so I'll try and, and um, you know, address um, each of them. You know, the first is, you know, what happens if we don't do ahead? Um, and I really do. I, you know, we get asked that question a lot. Um, that's why I started out the presentation with the why. Why are we thinking about this and why now? Um, as you know, our current model will not exist beyond 2025. Um, CMS has made that very clear to all states that they're not going to do these single state models anymore. And so um, it's not like we can stay in the status quo. Um, if we don't do ahead, um, we're really looking at fee for service for Medicare, um, mm -hmm. at least. And, um, you know, I think a lot of folks with, you know, was for the incentives that are baked into a fee for service um, model. You know, I think folks would see that as a step backwards. We've done a lot of work to um, really um, position ourselves to continue to advance um, uh, alternative payment models. Um, maybe we, you know, could do Medicare fee for service, but that leads to that type of fragmentation across payers that I think we've all worked hard um, to try and avoid as well. And if we don't participate, yeah, I think, you know, you all know I've been at this for a long time. Um, and, and we thank um, you for that. We know how much work you've done. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I mean, 
I I feel like you said, I see some opportunity here that I have not seen in prior models um, that have been offered by the federal government. It's not perfect. You know, there's some things that are missing, but I want to start with um, the investment in primary care. This is, you know, if we're looking at ways to address costs, and now I'm, um, you know, I think really going to get to your question about what does this mean for costs overall? What does this mean for commercial payer costs? There is, I, I, I just spent a couple days, Michelle and I did, um, talking to other states in Washington about um, primary care investment and sort of the evidence around that and why it's so important to continue to focus on improving investment in primary care. Um, it's better for patients. It's better for um, for it's better for the system. And so um, to see a model that actually says the state is going to be accountable for not only Medicare fee for service, primary care investment, but also all payer primary care investment, to see a model that um, you know actually makes a strong effort to increase payments through those advanced primary care payments for um, primary care practices that participate. To see a model that focuses the way that this one does on safety net providers, critical access hospitals, federally qualified health centers, rural health clinics, and that focuses on health equity, um, and how can we reduce disparities in health? How can we make sure everyone, everyone is getting the care that they need um, and deserve? That Those are um, some pretty encouraging aspects of this model that do um, potentially have impacts on outcomes and costs. And so sort of the more comprehensive nature here that we're seeing is encouraging. I think um, you've all um, probably heard me say that, you know, one area where they ex where CMS is expressing interest, um, but they are not, you know, there's nothing overt in the model, but they're definitely saying they want to see that balance from um, from, you know, hospital care. Um, let's invest more in community care and um, post-acute care, the very things that you're concerned about are bottlenecks in the system. Um, you know, there's definitely a, a, a desire to do that. And um, and so, um, you know, that that we I think we have some opportunity, even if it's not really over there. There is a fair amount to lose if we are unable for any of a variety of reasons to move forward with um, with a head. Um, you know, it includes, uh, you know, Medicare obviously wouldn't be in our um, health um, uh, in our in our health care reform so that, you know, we would not have Medicare at the table. Um, as you know, almost $10 million comes from Medicare to support the Blueprint and SASH programs. And if there's um, not continuity in the models, that's going to go away. Um, the $12 million in cooperative agreement funding, it's not a ton of money. Um, it might not be enough, but it's something um, to help um, Vermont continue to advance um, toward um, better health care for Vermonters. Um, the per member per month, those enhanced uh, payments for primary care would not be available. Um, and, you know, there's, again, that opportunity to really focus on equity. All of those things together, this is not a one solution. Um, yeah. So well, no, I I know that I'm just trying to, it's, it's helpful to think through and quantify what it's going to look like in a world where we don't do this, right? So the but for yeah. world, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And I, I think about, you know, you've raised some other important dollars coming into the state. I think it would be helpful to model the difference that we expect in federal dollars coming in 
under each scenario for the duration of the model, right? So there's federal dollars that are coming in and ahead. There would be federal dollars coming in if we were in fee for service as well. I mean, you know, there's dollars coming into the state and there's expectations on total cost of care reductions, you know, that are going to impact those federal dollars coming into the state. There's dollars coming in for um for blueprint and other you know really important programs but there's also costs associated with being in the program in terms of the regulatory costs and the compliance costs and the quality reporting costs all. so I, I guess I, and i'm only asking this because i think it's really important to 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 understand what what are we what does it look like in the world where we're going to go forward with this and what does it look like if we didn't and what are the what is the delta on the federal dollars that we can expect over the or the duration of the model um, and quantifying that, um, you know, and, and really trying to isolate the dollars that are coming in for healthcare services under each payment model, netting out dollars coming in um, that are tied to be doing the model, right? Do you know what I'm saying? So I, I try, yeah. I'm trying to understand that, and I think that's a really, um, I think that would be helpful for us to see. For example, if we go ahead with it, you know one of the rationales is potentially there's all this different targeted dollars to help us achieve our equity goals and our other types of goals. But I haven't seen that number yet, and I'm try trying to figure out how do we get our hands on that. Yeah, um, we, don't, we don't have the CMS methodology yet um, for hospital global budgets. Um, so, um, and, you know, frankly, you know, because there's some actually a lot of flexibility in a state design methodology, that'll be part of our if we were to be selected. And I want to keep emphasizing that there are other states. I just heard of another one today that's applying. I mean, there are plenty of other states that are interested in this, but um, you know, it's a competitive process. If we're selected, um, part of the negotiation will be around um, you know, how do we um you know, make adjustments in the hospital global budget methodology, and then we'll have a better sense of that number. And we should uh, look at that and model that as to what it means for the state. You know, it's a little hard to tell with fee for service because it really depends on volume of services. You can project what would happen if um, we were to revert back to a fee for service model. We could do some projections. So there, you know, I'm not going to over promise there would be some um, some estimates and some assumptions that would have to be made um, in doing that type of analysis. So we're anxiously awaiting the methodology. Then um, we would look at that and try to do some modeling based on what we're seeing. But the real modeling is around what we negotiate if we are selected in terms of the um, Vermont specific methodology, if that's the option we decide to pursue. Right. And that makes all the sense in the world. I, you know, I can appreciate mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff has to be done after we understand the CMS methodology and after we've, you know, designed these straw models and tested them and kicked the tires around a little bit on what the adjustments can be and what latitudes we have to to draw down more federal dollars in those adjustments. And I and I think that that will all I, I recognize that will all take place in the negotiation process. Um, I just think that if we have a strong understanding of, of all of this going in, we might be able to bargain for more. I, I recognize too that there may be other states that are competing with us and we may not have as much bargaining power, but you know, let's try and leverage all that we can um, to try and shore up some of the the challenges in our in our state as we see them now, some of these really acute challenges. What are the ways that we can address those through this model and through drawing down some federal dollars? Um, and I, I guess the the I have only I believe two other questions, I think. Um, one is I think you've heard me talk a little bit before about access, and and that's really something that I'm deeply concerned about. Um, and I think about our model now, which is you know a fee for service model where incentive is to drive volume, and we still have major access challenges in a model that's incentivized to bring as many patients through the door as is possible. And so I I think about how we model or 
or reflect on a shift towards a global payment model and thinking about how we're going to, you know, what we expect to happen with access and wait times and provider productivity. How do those incentives change for provider productivity, patient throughput? Like what, how do we think about that? How do we mitigate against access challenges that may ensue? And one of the things I think about is, um, before we embark on this model, we have to have a pretty good idea of the baseline access challenges we have now, the wait times, and we don't have a very good system in place right now to be monitoring wait times, frankly. Um, and it, we, you know, we do the best that we can through the hospital budget process, but it's not ideal um, in really understanding the patient experience and accessing specialty care or even primary care. And so part of what I think about is if we're going to go down this path, I think we need to be investing right now in developing a baseline understanding of what the access challenges are now so that we have a mechanism going forward to be monitoring any changes that we're seeing as a result of changes in the payment model. So I just want to put a plug in. I don't think we can wait until 2026 to start thinking about how do we monitor access because we need a really good baseline from which to move from um, or to understand any movements from. So I guess it's not really a question. It's just a concern I think I have. And and, and maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not going to be uh, a concern that we need to address, but I, I'd like to think about it now rather than waiting. I guess my last question, Pat, for you is a little bit of, you know, there's, there's the three cohorts and um, I think about the timing a little bit of, of our entry into this potential model, if it works out and we're selected and the negotiations work right. And I wanted to ask a little bit about optimal entry time. Uh, I think I asked this a little bit last time, but I've thought a little bit more about it since, since our last meeting. And um, on the one hand, I can see why early entry might be better because um, our all pair model agreement is ending and there's, you know, what do we do in this interim period? And we don't want to lose the momentum that we've had um, on this. But the other flip side of that is um, I think about this community engagement process that we're involved in now. And um, that process is going to lead to recommendations for delivery system reform, ways to improve efficiencies, reduce some of these bottlenecks, maybe create centers of excellence, think differently about how we deliver healthcare. And I'm just wondering the timing of making those changes and then on top of that, trying to layer on a payment system. So just wanted to ask your thoughts a little bit on there's so much happening simultaneously. There's the sunsetting of the all payer model, but there's also this really exciting opportunities to think differently about how we deliver healthcare. How do we fit it all in in a way that, that makes sense? If that's a reasonable yeah. question for me. Yeah, and I do want to just say agree with you on the access points that you made and the need to have a baseline, um, and that should be part of our monitoring process. Um, you know, I think the concerns um, we've already articulated around the discontinuity, um, we would definitely um, lose the the blueprint SASH funding and for SASH, as you know, that's 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 like the whole model, pretty much at least operating cost. Um, you know, there's a potential. Well, I'm not. I'll, I'll. You know, there just may we there may be a potential to uh, to get you know to in that flexibility to get some a little band aid um, or something. Some that was yeah, yeah, I'm trying not. I, th you know, I think we're venturing into negotiation territory, so I think I, I better just leave it at that. But there's, you know, there's some concerns um, with just continuity in terms of the transformation work um, that you all um, are engaging in. Um, you know, I, I don't see that as a deterrent because those things, you know, whatever the recommendations are and whatever uptake there is of those recommendations, it's going to take some time to implement. And that can only help us down the road if they are um, transformation activities that actually 
you know, result in better outcomes and lower costs um, for folks. So I, that doesn't seem a deterrent to me, although, you know, I hear what you're saying about the complexity of everything happening at once, but this is a complex environment. And I do worry a little about saying, okay, you're all in, um, you know, an all-payer model now, that's going to go away, go back to fee-for-service, then go to, you know, if we yeah. want to, say we're to, you know, want to try for 2027. I'm not sure it would be worth it because it would be, it, it, in other states where they're in fee-for-service and they don't have the kind of model we have, it's one transition. Here we'd be asking people to make two complicated transitions. And, um, you know, so I th think that's a concern when you look at the um, what we might have to, have to lose. Because really, like from an application standpoint, would I love five more months to yeah, um, develop sure. an application? Why, yes, I would. You know, it's only five months. months, you know. And then, right. um, and then um, you know, the, it's a year difference on the implementation, which that's more significant, but it's not, endless. And what CMMI has said is that they're going to award no more than five states for cohorts one and two. Now two has the later start date too, um, but um, they're going to award no more than five. So that would leave like three slots for cohort three or more if they don't award a total of five. So they're going to yeah. keep at least three for cohort three. So, and you know, if it, it's daunting, <laughs> it's an unbelievably complicated. I mean, the presentation we just heard, it's, um, you know, but it, it, Vermont is probably as well positioned as any state to um, tackle this and it's still complicated and daunting. And, you know, we've we've engaged in complex change before, and um, and and it, it it's a different landscape, but you know, it is an opportunity. Um, it seems to me. Um, right. I think given... no, it definitely is an opportunity. I'm glad we're exploring it. Um, and I think you said something very accurate before. We are very well poised to to do this, given the reform efforts that we've done so far, which tells me that we probably have a lot of leverage. <laughs> so because. But that's Maybe. you know. Yeah. Um. I. I. This is my last question. Is actually for Shule, and and then I'm pass pass the baton. Um. And this is um a little bit more about the details. And this is my only question about the details today because I've really got to absorb a lot of this you know um modeling here. But I think one of the key lessons we learned from the all payer model is that having a foot in two canoes is really just doesn't doesn't work, right? And we we know that expression. It's been completely overused, but the idea that you know you got to get enough of your patients in a particular payment model. This is the point of alignment that we're trying to achieve here. Um, and I believe that. I believe that sincerely. So when I look at this, the model requires only one commercial payer. Um, and only by year four, 30 percent of Medicare fee for service you know needs to be in a global budget by year four. So I'm just wondering, surely this is more for I think maybe for you, although Pat, you, you have such expertise in this as well. I'm wondering, is that enough revenue to incent the reallocation of resources and the delivery of system reform that we want? And is there a minimum floor with which we should say this model is only going to work if X percent, of the revenue is in fee for service, which means that we have to get a certain number of commercial payers in, and we have to get a certain, you know, proportion of of um, the public payer revenue in before we can really say that this is going to have a chance at success. So, is there a, a number in mind? Is there thoughts on this? How do we think about that? Well, uh, you know, I think that's a great question, and and. Probably we need to ask that to the hospitals <laughs> from their perspective, but from my perspective, I was trying to explain for the commercial side, given the number of plans and companies in the commercial one, if a commercial payer has very few residents in Vermont, like how are we going to think about it? We scratch the surface, surface on the commercial participation, but we, you know, end up working really hard on the Medicare side. We, I think we need to come back to it. Um, 
the other piece is, you know, it takes time to do those things too, right? So um, it, it may still be reasonable to start with, you know, substantial public participation and gradually build on the commercial one. I don't really have a good sense the pros and cons of doing that. Um, um, so, you know, those are kind of initial thinking, but really, um, I think you're right, like for a model like this to work, we are asking for major transformation. That means majority of the revenue should be under this and align. So that's that's given, but what that number looks like would probably depend on each hospital's kind of services and the commercial market that they have. And I don't know if you want to add anything else to it. No, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, clearly having, um, you know, a hospital having um, the two public payers and in Vermont, that's a pretty good chunk of their revenue um, and is, in fact, um, likely for most hospitals to, you know, be the majority of the revenue, especially given, you know, Medicare utilization. Um, but um I agree with Shule that, you know, we have focused on Medicare, but um, we would want to, um, if we were to move forward very quickly, um, dig in with the commercial um, methodology as well and see what, you know, gauge the interest. Um, you know, we've had some conversations with our commercial payers and they're part of our technical advisory groups. And, um, you know, so it's, um, you know, they're, they're at the table. Um, but, you know, there's a lot. We, we'd we have to essentially do the same kind of work for them. Right. Um, there's and similar flexibility. Yeah, yeah, and similar flexibility. We have similar flexibilities there as well. Um, so, in fact, maybe even more so than with the Medicare model. Awesome. Thank you so much, always. It's always great to hear from all of you. And thank you for answering my questions. I uh, appreciate you. it. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll I have a couple because I'll just go because they kind of relate to some of Jess's. Um, I guess in our hospital budget process, we heard a lot from hospitals about how the Medicare amounts weren't sufficient for um, their financial needs, and if the public payers are being capped at this market basket level, how is that going to be enough for our hospitals, because historically they've needed to, you know, look to the commercial payers for more money. And that's that's sort of been a big part of their presentations. So if we cap Medicare, how would that be enough money? So I'll start and Shule, please um, feel free to jump in as well. Um, but I think, you know, Again, um, one of the benefits of a global budget is that it provides um, significant flexibility in how care is delivered, and it provides that predictability in revenue. And um, you know, if um, if care can be delivered in a different way, um, and if we can do some of that rebalancing of the system so that primary care is um, is enhanced and um, and you know less hospital care is needed, then you know there is some potential for um, for not only um, you know we'd want to make sure that the revenues coming in through the global budget were set at a sufficient level allowed for trend, allowed for aging of the population and so forth. Um, but by the same token, if we can accomplish some of these changes in care delivery, it could also, um, you know, help us spend those Medicare dollars differently so that people were um, you know, whether it's telehealth or whether it's, um, you know, um, more um, primary care, there's a, there seem to be some areas where we could um, have less utilization and better outcomes for our, um, for our Vermonters. So I think there, you know, I think there's some potential, but, you know, a lot of it's around that baseline too and the adjustments that get made and how we can ensure that um, there's sufficient revenue to start 
that the um, trends are sufficient and that the um, the um, adjustments that we make are ones that make sense for our state. Shule, would you add anything to that? Yes, I I think the other piece, I think you touched it on, Pat, <clears throat> but the avoidable utilization is the highest among the Medicare population. So if you think about effective interventions, let's say ED visits or inpatient, if you have a diabetic clinic that is supported and can handle more than what they currently have, it's going to draw down inpatient utilization at the hospital. But hospital is going to keep that payment from their historical level, but they are not going to have the cost of providing that services for that utilization, right? They're going to save from supplies, you know, they could utilize their nursing staff for other purposes. So that's the rebalancing. Pat not is talking, report. even though a on a no, unit level. As soon as I can. Thank you. Medicare At may the tone, not please cover. record your message. When you've finished recording, you That's may hang. <laughs> so at the unit level, even if Medicare may not be paying full cost on the utilization side on their fixed revenue model, there will be potential savings for hospitals to reinvest. Okay. Um, so our hospitals are pretty unique in how they're um, where they're placed and sort of their circumstances, right? Like the rural nature of the state is really um, creates different opportunities and challenges for for our hospitals. How does this model address the rural nature of our state and our hospital structure? So um, I think you saw in um, one of the tables that Shule um, showed that. You know, there, the CMS has given a lot of consideration about how to get safety net um, hospitals and primary care providers into the model. And so, um, you know, there, I'll just give some examples. Um, for quality measures for critical access hospitals, that's an upside only construct for them. Um, they will they will get additional payments for quality. They will not um, get um, uh, downward adjustments. Um, they there is um, risk adjustment that occurs that would occur for both the hospital. Um, you know, global budgets and for primary care enhanced payments that are based on, um, you know, risk factors. And so um, practices and hospitals that serve more vulnerable populations would receive um, additional funding to try and meet their needs. Um, there's the, you know, transformation dollars that we've talked about that would help support um, that work as well. You know, I was thinking about when we were talking about geographic attribution, I was, um, when Shule was talking about that, I was actually thinking about what that would look like in a state where there's multiple hospitals in a service area, and it seems like it could be more complex um, in that kind of an environment. Um, you know, whereas in our um, rural communities, um, you know, hospitals, know who their communities are and know who um, who they're serving. You know, there's no question that the move away um, from um, cost-based reimbursement is, um, is challenging for our critical access hospitals to think about. And so that's an area, um, you know, that I think we want to keep discussing and exploring. But the model does seem to um, be, you know, designed to really try and bring some of those smaller hospitals and smaller providers um, into participation. And there's a, you know, a few different incentives that um, should help in that regard. And one um. addition, sorry, Owen, one more thing in terms of social risk. You know, they focused on area deprivation indexes, but Vermont could propose rurality as a factor. Um, so to me, uh, that could bring additional resources to our rural providers if we incorporate that into all the adjustments that we talked about. Is there any risk? So there's service line adjustments. If you add a service line, uh, you get an adjustment. And 
I guess one question I had is whether or not that could potentially favor larger hospitals vis-a-vis -vis smaller hospitals because potentially they want more revenue and so they might try and recruit uh, service lines from other hospitals. Is there any risk of that? And, and the problem with that could be that then the distribution of resources in the state gets consolidated. Shula, do you want to take that one? Sure. I think the risk is in the fee for service too, right? Right now, the same dynamics are occurring. So we need to think about how global payment is going to change that a little bit. And to me, that may create additional processes for states to um, think through the policy. So we talked about access relate as we are defining what adjustments will be made for new services. I will give you an example from other models where there is a list of essential services and maybe Act 167 work that we're going to hear may give us a little bit more what we mean by transformation and what those new services are. There might be adjustments up front for those services and for others, if it is about market shift, uh, that could be done at the end of the year to create that barrier in a in a way to avoid some of that consolidation issues, like because they have to bring the patients to them as opposed to upfront funding for access related services where hospital needs investment and new resources and they, they are kind of they don't need to bring the patients from another provider, if that makes sense. So there might be different ways of thinking about new service lines in the way you put the methodology together. And then, I mean, if we, if it were not in the first cohort, Vermont was in the second or, or later, I mean, would we actually be going back to fee for service? Because to me, it, I think someone said something about we're asking them to make two transitions, but to me, it looks like they'll very much be in fee for service anyway, right? Like part of this is going to be in fee for service. Part of it's not. If there's one insurer, if there's no professional services included, you know, depending on having hospitals so they're going to be in two systems regardless of when they join or am i am i misunderstanding that well certainly um for me i mean yes some hospitals get fee for service now but this would mean that medicare would go back to fee for service and you know that that at the payments you know the mechanics of the payments would be fee for service Um, and then I guess I think I think the last one, although I have many others, but one is um, you know, we have the 167 work that we're we're going to hear about and the transformation. This is going to what Member Holmes asked. There's going to be a report and some recommendations and opportunities of ways to streamline services, add services, reduce services, expand services, whatever they there may be. If I'm a hospital going into a new process with a global budget, I feel like I would be disincentivized to want to make those changes before I get my global budget. See that differently? So I do. Sorry, go ahead. can I jump no, in? I mean, we don't know yeah. the recommendations, but to me, if we can link those two streams nicely, if you get a prospective payment, if I'm going to close a service as a hospital, I may not need to worry about losing the revenue from those services from the get go, right? Because under fee for service, if I shut down, I lose everything right at that point. And if I'm opening a new service for me to earn that new service, I need to bring the new patients. So it's going to take time again for me to build up that revenue base for those new services. So I think without knowing too much detail on the Act 167, to me, there might be a nice alignment if we can figure out how to do it. It is complicated, but to me, I think that might be an opportunity for us to really uh, create a dynamic where um, the transformation, like finance doesn't become a barrier for transformation. Yeah, I was actually thinking along the same lines that, um, you know, that a, a global budget actually provides a bit of a glide path for those transitions. And, um, you know, chances are if a new service is 
being stood up based on recommendations that come out. I think you're getting recommendations in the spring. Um, you know, the timing is actually probably um, somewhat aligned there. And then a question I've just heard others ask um, is, why start at baseline? Are we considering the proper allocation on a statewide basis if we start at baseline? So for example, there's like two different levels of that. There's one statewide distribution of resources, right? So do we want this much money of our healthcare dollars in, in the hospital system? Or two, within the hospitals themselves, the 14, is this the right allocation for what they need today on day one? And then third, third level, even within those hospitals, is that how um, they should ideally for their community be dividing up and using their money with the services that they have? So really three levels. And I guess the question is really, what's the pro of starting at the current baseline and how does that consider the necessary cost to operating um, for their operating expenses? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, we obviously have some years of historical revenues that this board has um, influenced um, based on the information that you've gathered. And so, um, you know, I mean, first of all, see, that's what CMS has put forth. But I think there's some sense to it because um, it could be a major you know, it, it would be a major shock to reallocate um, when you've got years of historic um, baseline revenues um, uh, in a fairly highly regulated system. So. Um, I don't have any other questions. I think this is really exciting, and I think there's a lot of work to do in the negotiations and a lot to learn. Um, so thank you for keeping us informed and all the work that went into it. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to jump in with some questions here if I can. I don't know. Uh, I'm uh, unusual setup in an unusual location for myself, so I hope you can all hear me just fine. Um, so first of all, you know, thank you so much for all the hard work for the last better part of the year. Uh, trying to understand this system, digest it, and optimize it for, for, for Vermont. Um, I guess the first question I want to just bring up is on Medicare fee-for-service. I always feel like this is a kind of a complicated, nuanced discussion because while we are, we talk about reverting back to fee-for-service, but in many regards, but not all, I think, we're in fee-for-service now. So um, uh, at least it's reconciled back to fee for service, if I'm not mistaken. Is that that that's correct, right? On the Medicare side, yes. Okay. So it's not that we would go back to fee for service. We're in fee for service, but we would have different reporting requirements, and the payments would flow differently than our current situation. Not that we would revert back to something that that we're not in. Like, is that is that fair to say? Like, there's definitely an all payer model has allowed us to have different reporting requirements in the state, but but it's not that we'd revert back to something that's completely different than what we are doing now. You know, the model now has given um, hospitals and others who have taken prospective payments because the payments are prospective. They haven't, you know, been able to count on the you know non reconciliation, but you know they've been able to work together um, under an ACO organization to learn about what prospective payments look like, to you know share in some savings, um, and they've you know been able to do it on a multi payer basis. And, you know, during the pandemic, we certainly saw what a difference those predictable, um, reliable payments made. Um, you know, and it and and you know, there were still some incentives in place to provide appropriate levels of care. Um, going back to a total fee for service basis with no um, you know, no prospective payment construct 
it's, you know, it is volume driven. Um, it's, you know, people believe that it's part of the reason that we're in this situation, not the whole reason, but part of the reason why we're in the situation we're in now, where we've, you know, over the years, um, maybe not so much in Vermont as in other places, but we've seen costs escalate because, you know, in order to get paid, you have to see someone um, in order to maximize revenues, you, you know, need to increase volume. And, you know, it, that would that would be the incentive under a fee for service program, and it's not a model that um, you know folks believe has served um, the healthcare system well from a cost point of view, or maybe even from um, other points of view as well. So, I mean, it definitely would be a change um, for our providers in terms of how they're getting payments and what the incentives are. And I yeah. think, Dave, before you go in, you know, I believe in the current system, there is the shared savings component, even though it is reconciled back to fee for service, there is that target and shared risk through the ACO. Um, the way that I see a change is, you know, the current model is focused on individuals, right? Attribution, and we weren't able to achieve the scale target with all the complicated primary care out of state, et cetera. But this model is focusing on institutions and hospitals, like all hospital revenue under Medicare will be under global payment, regardless of where those patients live. So that's changing the dynamics to an institution as opposed to a patient uh, to capture the full revenue. Um, going back to fee for service kind of puts again back to the same thing about okay then it is about you know trying to attract and do more of the things that are profitable and if you are thinking about primary care as a focus point um linking primary care with the hospital is an important dynamic too because at the end hospital is going to move in this direction but primary care is going to move in the other direction right so uh, that's another reason why moving back to fee for service may create long term issues for the system because then there is not an alignment in the objectives um, for from the provider perspective. You know, one way that I think about global budgets being different than the current system, and, and I don't know if this is I haven't really talked about this. I've just thought about it is that um, in the in the all pair model that that shared savings is through the system and I feel like the, the incentive on a local level to achieve shared savings is low because well if you do really good work to achieve shared savings you know you generate less fee for service Medicare revenue but that maybe the whole system doesn't generate shared savings you don't get a payment back in the global budget if you generate shared savings in your local area you would keep shared savings to your to your hospital so that's one of the kind of the, the benefits that I think I see with the global budget methodology over the all payment payer model methodology. Um, I do think when we, this kind of gets to some of my other questions, which is when we talk about, um, when we talk about utilization within global budgets though, um, you know, Vermont has this remarkably low inpatient utilization rate for especially Medicare beneficiaries, but all, all people, all Vermonters per capita, we have a relatively high ED utilization. And so trying to figure out how, from, you know, from your, from looking at the data, especially think on, from your standpoint, Shule, I think you've delved pretty deeply into the, to the data that's available for Vermont. Um, you know, where do we, are hospitals going to be able to, to move that or hospitals can be able to reduce inpatient utilization further and what would be needed and how are hospitals can be able to reduce ED utilization um, from its current standpoint and then are there specific areas that we've identified uh, that that we can move that needle on. I, I, I'll i take it. Yes, there are lower utilization, but when you look at it, um, you know, 20 to 30 percent, depending on which hospital you are, is from chronic conditions. 
And from the patient perspective, it is better if we can find the right care before they end up at the hospital, right? It's a tough thing to do, but probably the right North Star that we should aim. Again, on the ED as well, there might be some low hanging fruit, but a lot of it is going to require coordination and long term investments to be able to shift those services. Um, you know, if you were to give this the higher like at a higher level, hospitals were and our systems were designed with acute illnesses, right? We haven't had major shifts in the way we delivered the care. Maybe, you know, in the last five years we did some, but at the end, I think we need to be bold and think about what is the ailing illnesses, our population and what kind of care they need and try to move in that direction, uh, even though it is going to be a hard thing to do. So, so to reduce those uh, chronic condition hospitalizations, uh, especially in Medicare patients, uh, I would assume we would need better primary care resources, specialty care resources, home care resources, long-term care resources, and post-acute care to resources. So does, I guess I'm trying to figure out, does, does shifting to the AHEAD model help any of those things directly? Or is it, uh, or are we sort of trying to build in there an incentive for hospitals to advocate for those things to be improved? I would say that the hospitals are strongly advocating on those issues as it is, particularly around the post-acute care and not just the hospitals, um, you know, home health agencies, um, the skilled nursing facilities. And I think, as you know, um, part of our work together has over well over a year has been to really um, focus in on how we can um, support um, those systems and being available so that people aren't um, boarding in emergency rooms or staying in hospitals longer than they need to. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. It's a, you know, the, the, this is another one of the all hands on deck um, type of efforts that we need to make together. But we have made some progress, um, you know, uh, AHS did some work um, around the Brattleboro retreat, and um, that seems to have um, helped with some improvements. There are certainly discussions going on around how we can, um, you know, uh, look at uh, reimbursement for skilled nursing facilities. Um, there, you know, we've um, we did some rate studies around home health, um, adult day, other um, areas of the system. And, you know, the legislature that resulted in some increases um, last year. And so that's work that we'll continue to do regardless, but um, it's definitely gonna take um, a concerted effort. Workforce is another area. I think, as you know, we've been um, really um, working hard to shore up workforce as well and have a number of programs um, that are in place to try and do that. But it's going to take a persistent and concerted effort um, from multiple facets to deal, to deal with these issues that um, are um, present, not only in Vermont, but across the country, frankly. And there are some opportunities there. I mean, those are opportunities. It's, um, but we we can't um, we ha we can't let up in our efforts there. So. Agreed. Strongly agreed. Um, this is one I guess mainly for Shule with your work in other states, um, and and having seen gold budgets be implemented, and the idea that. The cost savings and improve and which 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 is really the hospital sustainability community healthcare system sustainability benefits that come out of global budgets are really um pinned to the idea of improving prevention services uh up front and reducing costs um those are those are slow and long and hard things to do What's a, what do you think is a realistic timeline uh, for us in Vermont if we were to implement global budgets in 2025 to see 
those be the real reasons where we're saving saving money within the system and improving care? Um, <laughs> I'm getting all the difficult questions. Um, so the timeline, I can't really tell Dave, but I'll give you examples where there could be some short term savings opportunities, right? So in 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 Maryland, one hospital invited dentists to come. They looked at their ED utilization. They realized it was dental issues that they were dealing with. They worked with the local dentist and opened like a day and dentists came and provided services to the community. So that's a short term way for improving access, but also reducing utilization at the hospital. Long term, you have to figure out where, you know, where, how you're going to get that dentist 24 seven or right. So, but there are some places where given the right incentive and support for data and understanding the community, there might be things that we could do short term, uh, you know, Obesity, diabetes, hypertension, these are big public health program problems that require large investments in long term. Uh, another example on the nursing home side, one other hospital created a partnership with the local nursing home. They send their hospitalist to that nursing home, you know, one or two days to take care of some of the patients that will be transferred to the hospital, right? So through they rule like there is regulatory flexibilities that they received, but also kind of work with the nursing home to create some additional resources for that nursing home to solve again the short term problems. So uh, and these build up to a long term solutions, right? So um, in terms of the cost savings, Pennsylvania implemented rural health model. Their focus was on hospital sustainability, not so much on the cost savings. So we also need to think about our goals. What is it that Vermont is doing? And given what you mentioned on the Medicare side, um, if the transformation is the goal, short term with the baseline incentives, the trend will go up from the historical, right? So we need to be realistic about the upfront investments needed uh, for the long term. And, you know, AHEAD has a nine year implementation. So depending on the negotiations, uh, you know, it's the nine year glide path. Um, so I don't, I, you know, that's, that's another consideration to have. So I don't so have do you an that? answer so, to you. Do, I mean, are you, I guess, let me, the, the way I take what that, what you said with the nine year glide path is that say, for instance, you know, that, that we, um, that, that within a head, there's, a, that we that the glide path could be designed such that there's more upfront investment in the nine years. Yeah, and I think we should Medicare. take that to the executive session okay. since it's getting into the negotiation. But ahead has exclusions from the total savings. That's about right. They are going to exclude primary care. They are going to exclude transformation funding from the savings requirements. And then it is a nine year program. So at the end of the day, the guardrails of performance in one year doesn't necessarily kill the program, right? So that's the other consideration in terms of what is the trajectory of savings requirements and how state can negotiate with the federal government. Yeah, I think I think when I look at when this is presented to me today, I feel I'm looking at more as is this the right decision for Vermont as opposed to can we comply with what the what CMMI wants us to comply with? So that's just a you know, I think there's you know, I think we're just sort of looking at it slightly from a different perspective. But so from looking at it from that perspective, I'm a little bit more comfortable with something you just said, which is that the primary care services are excluded from the shared savings, because one of my other questions is, what if a hospital system was trying to invest heavily in preventative services, uh, increase their utilization? You know, we, you know, we have very, we have significant challenges with access to care in Vermont. I don't think we have nearly the problems that other states have with, you know, over utilization. You know, it's very focused in a few areas here that incre increasing access might help. So if a, if a hospital system tried to really improve access to care and blew through their Medicare budget uh, and and could 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 that cause you know 
harm to the hospital's sustainability by or 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 increased need on commercial revenue by trying to improve preventative services. And I think when Shule said primary care, Shule, I think um, did you mean the enhanced primary care Amos. payment? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that average $17 PM PM, I want to make sure we're clear about that. That would not be included in total cost of care calculations. Um, and um, yeah, so I just want to make sure we're clear. And, the and similarly, the transformation funding for hospitals. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if there was increased primary care spending, that would... Uh, count towards the total cost of care calculations. Yeah, uh, not counting the enhanced primary care payments that okay. Medicare is going to provide. Yeah. They'd be looking, you know, at claims, basically. Um, okay. Yeah. But, Julie, what did you think about, I mean, is that, you know, I just, I, yeah, I could see these scenarios where a hospital could get themselves in financial trouble by trying to really improve preventative care too quickly. Or, or does the adjustments, the annual adjustments, does that, you know, if a hospital so, spends a lot more money on, go ahead. I, I don't, I, I mean, I don't think so. I think if they invest in primary care, open new clinics, right, they should prospectively get additional adjustment for new services. And, and eventually, not on the same year, but their utilization would come down, right? Um, so they need to, I don't think there is, there is what that if their much of a risk. Went up? So, I mean, so say we have people who aren't getting care and then they get care. And now you're having increased utilization. People who go to primary care providers who haven't seen a primary care provider tend to get more lab tests, more imaging because they've just not had access to care. Uh, so would that scenario then lead to, that scenario could lead to an increased total cost of care, but it might increase the good care, increased, not too good care, increased good care. So, so if a, so if a primary, so if a, so if say a, say a hospital system opens a primary care clinic with uh, 10 primary care providers and you increase, you have all these new patients that come in because there's really challenge getting primary care access right now. And those patients then get lab tests and imaging, the total cost of care is going to go up. But those patients were, in the historical terms, ending up in EDs and inpatient setting, right? So if they don't have access, that's the dynamic that we are trying to break. Short term, there may there may need to be adjustments, but you know, I I don't I think that's the right thing to do under global payment. Uh, Pat, if you want to add anything to me, no, I, I don't I, see. I yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Some of, you know, some of the results of not getting primary care, it's pretty quick, you know. Um, people do land in the ED, um, you know, I possibly some of those uh, potentially, you know, ambulatory care sensitive condition, um, you know, they may end up inpatient once they get primary care. They, you know, they're less likely to land there if their conditions are managed. And that, you know, that's not a year's thing, probably, but you're you're the physician. So I'll, I'll ask you, um, you know, yeah. it seems like while there may be a delay uh, to some degree and seeing that lower utilization, um, you know, the if they have a medical home, the ED is not their medical home anymore. You know, so. Yeah, my understanding of the literature, people who don't have access to primary care, when they get access to primary care, the total cost of care goes up. But that, that's my, that's just my understanding of literature. There may be newer, newer literature that's more, you know, that's probably well, 15, 10, 15 years old. Right, for individuals, for them, yes. But if you think about population health, how much of that is because it's going to reduce their historical, right? So. For an individual, you may be right. Like if you're thinking one person, I had one visit, now I'm going to have three visits. I'm going to have EDs. You know, at the end, on the individual side, it is, I think the question is at the population level, what will happen to the total cost? 
that's my that's my understanding is on the population level. I would never suggest, by the way, that we don't provide primary care for people. I think having primary care services is the ethical and right and humanistic thing to do. But my understanding is if people are not getting primary care and now they are getting primary care, you do have an increase in total cost of care because now you get treatment for all the diseases that they weren't getting treated for before. Uh, it, better quality of life. It's more it, it's it's more ethical. It's the right thing to do. But I don't know if it uh, I'm my understanding of the literature at least, and I and I could be and I, I again I, I am not a primary care physician, and I, and you know uh, is is that. If people are truly not receiving primary care. That when it gets into, uh, you do increase the the amount of uh, sorry treatments. You increase the amount of testing, uh, and and these are these are actually good things to keep people healthy and keep people probably healthy, healthy uh, and living better quality of lives, uh, better quality of lives longer. But, um, I had one, um, I guess, just one more question, which is kind of like why why I saved the bomb for the last question, but. It was supposed to be earlier, in my, but we kind of end up going in this direction, which is, you know, you, you've been looking at global budgets for a long time, and um, global budgets has the potential to solve a lot of problems. But what's the downside to global budgets? Where where are the pitfalls? Where 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 do we need to double our efforts to to not get into traps if we do global budgets? Transformation plans. Sorry. Yeah. Pat. I'll start and then Shule jump in because you have way more experience than I do with global budgets. But, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, the need to monitor um, utilization and just, you know, make sure that people, you know, we want to reduce um, avoidable care for sure. Um, but and we want to ensure that care is in the right setting. But by the same token, we would want to monitor um, for utilization and trends to make sure that people are, are um, you know, we're not seeing big changes in, um, in, you know, access to care. So I think that's really important. That's why we added sort of that fourth category on the um, performance framework around monitoring. Go ahead, Julie. Yeah. Jessica's point about access measures, right? So that's place where we really have to be advancing the way we measure, measure access and quality. And I, I mentioned transformation. We focus a lot, and I, I personally obviously focus a lot on the financial side, but believe it or not, that's the easier part. Um, the issue is once they have the global budgets, what the hospitals are going to do and what is the commitment from the leadership and the staff. So uh, that's, that's the place where we need to focus and invest a lot of effort, understanding, helping, and working with the hospitals uh, to really make things happen on the ground. Um, a lot of the physicians, clinicians don't know how the hospitals are getting paid, right? So at the end of the day, it's about changing the practices where we need to spend a lot of time um, once we remove the financial barrier from uh, doing the right thing. And I would just add um, paying careful attention, um, continuing to pay careful attention to um, the continuum of care, um, post-acute care. How can we use this model to support um, post-acute care um, and preventive care too. So. Thank you. I think I think only Robin's left, but uh, I don't know if Robin even has questions because she's like the, the master. Oh Tom, sorry, I apologize, Tom. So so let me let me um, step in just for some timekeeping because we have to do um, we have to get to Dr. Hamry. So I connected with um, uh, Member Walsh and, and Lunge, and they have kindly agreed to hold their questions. And a lot of our questions, I think, covered some of theirs. And and so I think they're kindly going to agree to wait on theirs. We also have a couple questions from Member Holmes that were for executive session. We're going to wait on those as well and do those um, uh, the next time. Uh, Pat and Shule are back. Um, so I apologize for that. There's a really robust discussion that had, has been really informative. So I didn't want to. So unless Robin or Tom, you would need something today. OK. All right. So I didn't want to get public comment in. Um, so so thank you to Robin and Tom for uh, recognizing the time issue. Um, 
So I will open up to public comment. If uh, if if anyone has public comment, please use the raise your hand function. Uh, Ms. Aronoff, nice to see you. How are you? Please go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon. Really quickly, the next time you guys have one of these presentations, and I think they're just so wonderful, and we, by the way, love the AHEAD model because equity, equity, equity. Um, I would like to know the perspective of the Green Mountain Care Board as to whether or not you guys see yourselves as becoming a signatory like the Green Mountain Care Board was for the au pair model or a regulator. And I'm just trying to get a handle on who's doing what in the healthcare space, especially as people are discussing uh, S211 and things like that. And so I just would love to hear the Green Mountain Care Board's perspective on where it sees its role in this future model. Not for now, but as an agenda item. Um, and I don't know, Pat, if, if Green Mountain Care Board would be a necessary signatory or we don't have to go there. But anyway, I feel like when you guys were a signatory before, there's just been a lot of role confusion as to whether or not you guys are reformers and promoters or regulators. And I think there were a lot of goalposts moved to support the success of the all-payer model um, by the regulators. And as someone who was a skeptic and still am and concerned about how Medicaid was sort of hijacked to support the all-payer model, I just would love to know what you're planning to do going forward. So food for thought, and thank you so much for spending all the time. I thought today's discussion was one of the best healthcare policy discussions I've heard in Vermont in a really long time. I just thought it was fantastic and deep and rich. And thank you, Pat and Chule, for all the work you're doing and the Green Mountain Care Board for all your robust questions and onward. Thank, thank you for saying that, Susan. And obviously, Pat and Chule are real experts. I will just note that probably our two biggest healthcare policy wonks on the board didn't even get to ask questions. So <laughs> it's that's that's high praise. So thank you for that compliment because uh, our big guns were saved today um, with their with their big health policy minds. Um, and and I would just say to briefly address your questions, we can get to others. Um, I think some of the role of the board questions may be um, discussed potentially by others or maybe even us during the S211 discussions. I think there's a hearing notice. I know there's a hearing notice for Friday where some of that could be um, topical. The other thing I would point out is um, I think that the NOFO may have details on some of this. And, and then the last piece I would say is that the care board's role and what we do is assigned to us by the legislature. Um, so our role in this is to collaborate with AHS. Um, so that's, that's where we fit in and, and what we're doing. Um, and we are decidedly a regulator as well, of course, but I appreciate the comment and it's a it's been a topical discussion since I applied for this position um, and I think it's a good one to have. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments? Walter, it looked like you came off of mute, but I don't see you and you usually pop up. Oh, yeah. Hey, I apologize for the noise. I'm at the state house and a big party just descended. So I'll keep it simple. I just wish this could be so simple. <laughs> All the time. I mean, I've been listening to it for three hours. My God, why does everything have to be so complicated? Keep it simple. Well, I think there's a lot of value to that perception. Um, enjoy the state house party uh, today. Any other comments or questions? It's oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. A anyone else? Chair Foster, can I just highlight the schedule for the next time we're in front of the board on this topic? 
it's scheduled for February 21st. Um, and I have am in the process of sending an email um, asking to extend that time of that meeting uh, or the agenda item um, to be able to sort of allow for more more discussion as needed. That will likely be the last time we're in front of the board prior to submission, just given the last couple of weeks prior to the notice of funding opportunity submission. Um, and so I just want to flag that that's We'll make it a, a longer agenda. We'll give it we'll give it more time, um, but we'll be back on the 21st. Great, thank you. OK, um, you know you guys are doing a lot of work, so thanks for taking time out of your days to help educate and teach us. Um, Pat and Chule, thank you. Thank you. All right, we will uh, not skip a beat here and turn to Elizabeth Sutherland. Uh, Dr. Bruce Hamry and uh, Marissa Melamed. Thank you for waiting. Marissa, I, I can't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> You're on mute, Marissa. Can you hear me now? I had the double mute going on. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, great, okay. Um, so I'm gonna try to keep this short and hand it off to um, Bruce and Elizabeth, but just for some background, um, we're here today to get an update on the Act 167 Community Engagement Update. Uh, first, again, my name is Marissa Melamed and I serve as the project director on the Green Mountain Care Board staff for this project. Um, we have hired a great team to do this work. We are um, into or through phase one and into phase two of the project. Um, so it's a good time for an update. Um, and uh, we wanna hear um, some of the things that have uh, uh, come up on the road. Um, the, let me move ahead here. Um, you've seen this slide several times before. It's always to keep people oriented to this several sections of uh, Act 167 or the several work streams. I'm gonna introduce the Oliver Wyman principals that we hired to complete this work, um, who may already be familiar to many of you, but we have Dr. Bruce Hamery and Elizabeth Sutherland. Uh, Dr. Hamery is, a, is a, the leading partner in the project. Um, he's a clinician um, with over 50 years of experience um, in healthcare leadership um, and healthcare systems and transformation, uh, particularly in rural hospitals. Um, he's also familiar to many of you um, through his three years of experience in Vermont with COVID data modeling um, and health services wait time report. Um, and he is joined by Elizabeth Sutherland, who is an expert in examining health disparity and overcoming health equity barriers. And they have been leading um, all of the meetings uh, and design and, and development of this project since we began in August. Um, so that's when the contract started. Uh, the first several months ran through several months of engagement plan development. Um, that was a robust process with extensive stakeholder engagement to put together a plan um, for how uh, Bruce and Elizabeth and team were gonna go around the state um, and talk with um, with stakeholders and everyone in the healthcare landscape um, to uh, glean information um, on their experiences um, in the healthcare system. Um, in October, uh, the project moved into the phase one round meetings, which were an extensive and statewide series of listening sessions targeted to community members at large, providers, and members of diverse populations. Um, those meetings ran from October 24th through November 21st. Um, we're gonna see the numbers on how many people um, were engaged with and outreach to and participated in those meetings on the next slide. Um, we're currently now in a data synthesis and analysis phase, which runs December through March. Um, where the Oliver Wyman team will use the data collected from the listening sessions 
uh, combined with relevant analysis of health systems claims and hospital discharge data to inform preliminary options and recommendations for um, hospitals. And the round two meetings will commence in the late spring, likely May, and run for several months. So what you're going to hear about today is um, findings from those discussions in the round one. So we're in data synthesis and analysis, but the um, information you're going to hear about today um, is mostly the quanti uh, sorry, qualitative data that was gleaned through those uh, interviews and, and uh, community meetings. So we're really pleased with the numbers of people and organizations that were engaged. We had over 1,800 participants across all stakeholder types in these meetings. There's an average of 52 participants per community meeting, uh, including the statewide meetings. There were two meetings held in um, each HSA. Um, so all 14 HSAs uh, had a community meeting for the community at large and then another meeting targeted to providers. Um, there are also additional, more targeted um, meetings going on at the same time, um, which Bruce and Elizabeth will talk with you about. Um, there were over 100 organizations that were contacted through our uh, outreach uh, contact list. Um, and to date, um, the count when this slide was put together was 93 or over 93 public comments, written public comments received. Um, and I won't go through in detail the, the numbers here on the right, um, but this is just kind of one way we uh, sliced up the different types of meetings um, to understand who we outreach to um, and how many participants there were in these different groups. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Henry. Great, thank you very much, Marissa. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to uh, give you an update on our progress. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to really thank the many Vermont healthcare providers, not only uh, nurses, physicians, but EMTs, pharmacists, dentists, and many others for taking time out of their evenings after a very busy day to offer their experience and advice. We also need to thank the many Vermonters who took time out of their days to share their lived experiences with seeking, obtaining, and uh, using healthcare in the state. Uh, during this effort, as uh, Marissa noted, we've also had the chance to talk to the leadership and board members for each of Vermont's hospitals. Without exception, they were a professional and knowledgeable group of people doing the best they can to serve their communities while working within a very dysfunctional health system. Uh, the participation of Mr. Mike Fisher, the state health care advocate in many of these community and provider meetings was invaluable. And certainly uh, last but not least, uh, I need to thank Marissa, uh, and her group uh, who have helped to guide my team through the complexities of the various state agencies and healthcare organizations in the state, uh, as well as the groups and representatives of the groups experiencing health inequity. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Marissa. So um, we'll talk briefly about the goals, uh, spend a lot of time on the work completed to date with the preliminary findings. And just to reemphasize Marissa's point, these are entirely based on comments uh, made during uh, one or more of these meetings. Uh, they are representative comments, they're not, uh, we obviously can't include them all, but they do reflect the themes um, that are involved. Next slide. Okay, so we were asked uh, or directed to develop and conduct a process that was data informed, patient focused, and community inclusive. 
uh, to the data informed part thus far, we have reviewed as many of the uh, prior consultant reports to the Green Mountain Board and other uh, state agencies, uh, including those on workforce um, and uh, mental health. Reviewed the state, uh, Vermont State uh, Health Plan, the uh, various uh, community health needs assessments for each of the hospitals and so forth. We've also reviewed data made available through the Green Mountain Care Board, including the hospital budget submissions, uh, the uh, VCURES data, and so forth. I think Marissa has expressed to you uh, the extent of our patient-focused and community-inclusive uh, efforts, uh, which I think have been um, as complete as time and availability of um, the uh, uh, those groups uh, could be. We have been asked to produce um, some outputs from this uh, process, uh, and remember, we are only part way through it. Uh, and those goals were to reduce inefficiencies in the hospitals, to lower their costs, and I would say constrain cost growth improve population health outcomes, reduce health inequities, and increase access to essential services. And so we're, we're gonna start with going through one by one, the nine essential community health services listed by the uh, American Hospital Association. We'll then go to uh, the diversity uh, and inequity uh, issues uh, and to um, uh, some of the financial uh, considerations. Next slide. Okay, so the first one is access to primary care, subject to a lot of discussion over the last few hours. Um, and I, each slide starts with some representative comments from some of the participants. Uh, you'll note the second one here, no one is taking new patients. There's a one-year waiting list for new patients. Uh, we've heard other numbers up to 18 months. So there is a shortage, and as noted previously, uh, practitioners are aging and retiring. Um, and there is a lot of concern on the part of the provider community about their inability to help patients get care and we'll come back to that in some other areas. And so that, that is causing what is called moral injury. That is, you, you feel devastated that you can't get your patient to an appropriate specialist or hospital to get the care they urgently need. Uh, there's also a shortage of advanced practice clinicians. Um, no no in-state training for PAs and not a master's level program for advanced practice nurses. Uh, somewhat lengthy training for doctors of nursing practice to get a clinical certification, but very importantly for all of the state efforts to uh, educate medical assistants, RNs and others, there is a shortage of both instructors and clinical sites. And that also nationally is a major roadblock to producing uh, more of these uh, needed people. Um, there is another feature in um, primary care and indeed for most of the all the physicians, and that is that administrative complexity reduces their clinical time available. Uh, one of the quotes from a practicing doc is he or she said, I spend at least two hours a day doing uh, prior authorization uh, and uh, pre-cert and arguing with insurance companies and state agencies about things. And if you consider that a, a doctor in those two hours could have seen either four or six more patients, that means they could have had somewhere over the course of a year between 700 and 1,000 additional patient visits. So <clears throat> this is a, 
a matter that might be corrected in fairly short time and in, have some impact on access. Uh, another is the cost of this. Another physician noted that his office has had to hire four support staff for each clinician in order to handle the paperwork and all the other things that they are um, responsible for. In addition, everyone's experiencing difficulty in recruiting new professionals to the state. A lot of it has to do with housing, and we have heard reports about advanced practice people sign on the dotted line, come to work, spend three to six months in a hotel because they couldn't get housing, and then they left and went out of state. Additional issues, lack of child care, poor support for elderly relatives, uh, and relatively low pay, at least as perceived by those reporting. So this is a data point we need to uh, validate. Next slide. Okay, uh, psychiatric and substance use treatment. Um, <clears throat> one mental health advocate noted that an emergency room is not the place for mental health care. Uh, and uh, uh, mental people who have mental health issues give up after they go to an ED and are treated as though they have a physical ailment rather than a mental health issue. There is a sh shortage of psychiatrists and mental health professionals. Had several uh, instances cited of psychiatrists and others leaving for better paying jobs elsewhere. Um, there have been comments, many, about very uh, relatively severe difficulties in having uh, licensed uh, clinical social workers and other mental health professionals who are licensed and have practiced in other states and their ability to obtain uh, an unrestricted license in uh, Vermont. Uh, this was noted in a mental health report, but the mental health group was given five years to fix this. A uh, shortage of mental health beds for acute and chronic needs, uh, 194 beds available um, roughly in the state and 23 additional for children. Um, and this is a quote from a state official. I would note that of those beds, 30 are now closed for renovation and other things. And at another hospital, they have 14, but they are double rooms. And so typically they said they can only uh, serve eight to nine patients because they have to, of course, put men with men, women with women, and at least reasonably similar diagnoses. So um, shortage and, and another issue other than lack of inpatient, which causes boarding, is lack of intensive outpatient treatment and daycare services, lack of group housing for appropriate patients. We talked to one community where they were had just gotten permission to build a group housing. It took five years to get through the regulatory processes. Um, difficulty in finding transport for suicidal patients. The police cannot take them. So they require an ambulance uh, to, to go, and ambulances, as we'll hear about, are in short supply. Uh, and lack of appropriate facilities in emergency departments uh, for uh, acutely ill uh, mental health patients. Next slide. Uh, emergency and observation services, a uh, key point for avoidable hospital use. Uh, one of the ED directors, and we spoke with most around the state, not all, um, this person said many patients that are labeled avoidable actually must be seen. They come from skilled nursing facilities, police, uh, social service agencies, and others, and they have nowhere else to go. The hospital is, the, in a sense, the court of last resort. 
Um, as noted in the prior set of discussions, a recent estimate by another consulting group a couple of years ago was that 30% of ED visits were potentially preventable by availability, readily, ready availability of primary care or community-based mental health services. However, those EDs are often crowded and holding patients who need to be transferred to uh, for another level of care, either to another hospital or to a mental health facility, or they're unable to go home. Um, one hospital reported a need to use eight beds in their ED out of, I think it was 15, to board inpatients awaiting transfer. And this was not an uncommon report. Another hospital reported opening 12 new ED beds and having eight of those occupied by people who were being boarded within four weeks. So an urgent matter. Uh, observation beds are also commonly used for boarding and specialty coverage for ED patients uh, where people could get advice, perhaps take care of the patient in the local hospital and then uh, send them home um, is difficult, specialty coverage. Telehealth is expensive, uh, sorry, is helpful and is used by some hospitals. Others have reported uh, it is uh, too expensive for them to uh, afford. Next slide. Okay, prenatal care. We did not in the um, general community comments have uh, any mention of inadequate prenatal care. Uh, I'll turn it over to Ms. Sutherland in a minute for the diversity issues. Um, but I would say the review of the state uh, vital records, uh, which report the uh, prenatal care that women receive by, uh, by month prior to delivery, suggests that generally prenatal care is available and used. Uh, there are exceptions for women under the age of 20, certainly. Elizabeth, do you care to comment on these other two points? Yeah, I think the only thing I would just call out, um, and can you guys hear me? Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I think the only things that I would just call out is that um, while the data isn't there, and you'll, you'll hear the same later, um, there still is, there should still likely be effort and to try to understand why the, the um, why there is this um, uh, variation. Um, it's not something that the rest of the United States isn't experiencing, um, but it is something that uh, is is impacting those that we've interviewed, not from um, a personal standpoint, but from their opinions on where they would go to have and receive childcare. Um, and then this final bullet here, I think is similar to the transportation um, um, barriers or gaps or challenges that, we, that we've heard across other services is that you know, UVM's great, others facilities are great, but the, the wraparound services provided um, when you're two hours, six hours, eight hours away from your home um, doesn't seem to be thought through, um, particularly when going to the NICU. And so um, it's kind of just like moving and transferring and the family will figure it out themselves for how they're gonna get there. And by nature of the, of the state, that's kind of the situation we're in, but it is, it's a challenge. And so you'll, see, you'll hear that theme too in a couple other transportation areas. But. Yep. Right. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Okay. Transportation is a huge issue. It is not only an issue of inequity in terms of access and availability. It is also having a major impact on the uh, efficiency and effectiveness of the hospitals and the care providers in the state. Uh, one of the local care providers noted that in their area, almost 20% of patients did not have a car. And this was a rural area. Uh, another uh, community member said ambulance service is critically important and there is not enough ambulances to go around, which increases wait times for getting service and as we have noted from ED people, getting between hospitals. So personal transportation is often lacking. Uh, 
inability to afford the gas if, if money for gas if you have to travel and hospitals are often supporting this with coupons and things a uh, public transportation may not be available when needed the uh, movers that are used for medicare patients and others are available only during work hours and need to be scheduled 48 hours ahead so of course if you have an urgent issue need to get to the doctor's office uh primary care office or or ed uh it's not that service is not available to you um bus routes may not connect together well as we've heard uh and we've heard routinely that patients who are taken to the emergency room by an ems service that transportation is paid for only if medically necessary. So it's medically necessary on the way to the hospital. It's not on the way home. So there's no transport for the patient at midnight when the ED says you can go home to get them home and the patient winds up uh, sleeping overnight in the um, uh, emergency room waiting area uh, in many instances. Uh, availability of EMS transportation for inter-hospital transfers, I apologize for the typo, uh, is sporadic. And we've heard stories of people calling 19 or more different EMS services to find an ambulance crew that is able to take a patient somewhere. One EMS service, actually 31, uh, was the max. Uh, one EMS service reported spending a number of hours with the patient uh, in their ambulance waiting to take the patient into the emergency room because the emergency room was full. So this is at all levels. Uh, patients often need to travel long distances. We talked, uh, heard from one gentleman uh, whose spouse had a significant health care problem. They had to go to a major medical center. And he reported that within a year, he spent, uh, they spent $5,000 um, for hotel costs and uh, transportation costs and traveled roughly 8,000 round trip miles to get care. So as Elizabeth noted uh, earlier, in a rural area, access to certain services is uh, very difficult and a lot of that cost falls on the person not on certainly not on the system next slide diagnostic services uh, timely access to have your issue diagnosed uh, one physician noted that in their local area, there was a six month wait time for a colonoscopy. Uh, colonoscopy obviously being a recommended preventive service. Um, and so this issue is something we'll look at in terms of how well is it done? What are the potential numbers of people who maybe uh, don't have uh, access to this? Um, specialized diagnostic equipment, for example, for pulmonary function tests, uh, is often uh, not available in the smaller hospitals. Population may be too small to support it. Um, there is a universal problem having the technical help to actually administer the test, and that's true uh, across all the sizes of hospitals and nationally, by the way. Uh, hospitals are dealing with this by trying to jointly hire or share both the specialist uh, and acquire the equipment needed to, to do these tests in rural areas. Uh, access to certain specialty services and tests at the two major referral centers, Dartmouth and uh, uh, UVM, are uh, limited and particularly for non-emergent care. Uh, timely access to interventional cardiology. Uh, again, we've heard uh, uh, stories of patients with what's called a STEMI, which is uh, an indication of acute myocardial infarct uh, in one of the major arteries uh, of the heart, uh, being placed in an ambulance and sent five hours 
to a hospital that could do that procedure. The standard of care nationally is one hour. So medically unacceptable. Uh, patients with unstable angina who should have a rapid evaluation uh, because of shortages in um, uh, equipment availability have sometimes had to wait three or more days uh, to get that intervention. Problems are, that are common to all hospitals, including the two referral, major referral centers, include lack of enough specialists, a shortage of technicians, as I've noted, uh, and uh, obtaining timely pre-certification for uh, testing and treatment. Uh, I note that Congress uh, acted, I think, to, or uh, CMS acted today to uh, tighten that up for Medicare beneficiaries. Next slide. Home care. Um, home health agencies have had to reduce their services because of a lack of staff. They, they can't compete for wages with the hospitals and other uh, employers. Uh, and that is based in part on poor reimbursement. And so several of the, all the nursing home, uh, nursing uh, uh, home health agency people that we spoke with uh, cited that as a problem. Next slide. Dentistry. Again, a major problem, um, and a community member just said, look, uh, many doors are slammed because dental providers won't accept Medicaid. And this is uh, in spite of the fact, as Mr. Fisher pointed out in some of the meetings, that uh, the state has recently raised um, rates of, to pay dentists for Medicare or Medicaid uh, uh, beneficiaries. Uh, that was done, I think, in last July, maybe a little early to estimate that impact. It's a statewide problem. It is particularly severe for children and Medicaid patients. Uh, the lack of preventive dental care clearly shows up in the potentially preventable ED visits. And I would note that when major dental work is needed for children, they often have to be put to sleep. They have to undergo major anesthesia, uh, which uh, is a health risk and not available in all hospitals. Pediatric anesthesia, um, particularly for small children, is a specialized service. Next slide. Okay, robust referral structure. Can you get a patient to a specialist when they are needed. Uh, and primary care doc just said, can't find specialists for my patients now. Uh, it's functioning very poorly. This is not a change from work that uh, the state did with some of my group a year and a half ago. Uh, shortages of virtually all specialists at UVM and Dartmouth, long wait times for routine services, uh, often, uh, usually they can meet emergent needs, although there are a number of instances where patients have had to be transferred to Boston, Portland, Maine, New York City, uh, large hospitals in Connecticut uh, to receive those specialty inpatient services. Uh, recruitment of uh, all medical and surgical specialists uh, is a problem statewide and at Dartmouth. Uh, communication from uh, the specialty groups back to the primary care providers is poor. Uh, we've heard uh, a number of comments. Uh, the state health information exchange is intended to help rectify this. It's still under development. Uh, the primary care folks have said does not deliver adequate uh, accurate medication lists or uh, a list of currently active diagnoses, that they'll get a list of 30 diagnoses and they can't tell which ones the patient really has at the, in the near term. 
and that the med lists are often well out of date and represent drugs that the patient is not on. So uh, the lab results are much better, but with those two elements, other two elements lacking, timely decisions about treatment are difficult. Uh, note the hospitals and the physicians are on a number of different EMRs, and they're really dependent on the health information exchange to connect with one another and transfer information. Uh, same issue with getting consultation notes from specialists. Uh, and an additional note uh, about the um, one care. Uh, was not considered by the docs uh, to be timely in getting the information they needed to provide care to patients. So getting a list of who has diabetes, who am I trying to take care for, uh, uh, trying to take care uh, of for those preventable issues uh, was not considered to be good. A uh, complicating issue with all of this which really impacts specialty availability is that the specialists say, look, I take a patient who has diabetes, has uh, epilepsy, I get them stable. They are on meds, they can go back to their primary care doc, but the primary care doc can't see him, he doesn't have room. Or the uh, uh, advanced practice person feels uncomfortable. So the result is the patient keeps coming back to the specialty clinic, which uh, means that new patients don't have access. Next slide. Okay, uh, costs. Well, as you've heard, costs are universally uh, considered to be too high. A lot of opinions about why this is high hospital costs, uh, poor access to early treatment and preventive care resulting in patients with more advanced and severe, thus costly disease. Number of the emergency room uh, physicians and specialists commented on that. Uh, repetition of tests, uh, and that was commented on by both patients and physicians. And then uh, the widely held view that both hospitals and insurance companies have a profit motive and drive, want to drive volume. Uh, hospital costs clearly, as the board has already heard from its uh, uh, budget hearings, um, staffing costs are uh, huge. Uh, there are increased costs of employment, that, uh, of em uh, getting employees and retaining employees because of national shortages. Uh, use of travelers to fill in nursing vacancies and various technical uh, areas, uh, and the use of essentially travelers, locum tenens, by hospitals to staff certain physician services, or uh, the use of telehealth uh, with attendant uh, high cost. That is, the person providing the telehealth uh, charges the hospital more than the hospital is going to get reimbursed for. Uh, and then on the hospital part, uh, the 340B funding, the federal drug um, program, uh, has been reduced. That often accounted for a significant part of the hospital's uh, pro uh, uh, excess of revenue over expense. Next slide. Okay, Elizabeth. All right, thanks. Um, so just rounding out uh, some of the observations, wanted to dive a little bit more deeply into some of the barriers um, to health equity that were being, exper being experienced by um, typically uh, marginalized or um, smaller populations. And so to um, get started, um, we worked with kind of the list to the left um, as, as our guiding principle for those that we wanted to engage, reach out to, hear from um, either directly or a representative in, in areas where we weren't able to connect uh, in person um, because of language, especially because of language barriers. And so um, big thank you to uh, many folks on the line here for helping kind of stitch together the different groups across the state um, to, to get in touch with these um, 
see it in touch with perspectives and hear perspectives from, from the groups on the left. Um, through about 30 targeted interviews, um, about half of those were with smaller groups and then the other half coming from community, community sessions. Um, we identified three kind of trends um, in terms of areas for uh, improvement. There were bright spots that we heard. I know that the focus here is really where's the opportunity of this presentation. Um, there, we definitely did hear some bright spots around uh, different in different HSAs, um, providing access and providing coordination for um, members of the groups to the left. Um, but this is homing in on you know what we heard as um, areas that recommend uh, attention, uh, prioritize attention to uh, decrease the health equity barriers for these groups. And so those three areas are, are around um, culturally competent care, um, culturally competent and psychologically safe working environment, so the patients and the employees, um, and then coordination with, with uh, caregivers and community services. Um, and so just diving into the first one around culturally competent care, a couple areas, um, obviously there is a large, um, uh, as we mentioned before, I think on the, on the prior speaker, um, the rurality and then the economically disadvantaged um, are, is, is a big, the large number of people and they have a different experience with the medical system than those that are not economically disadvantaged and in very rural areas. And I think one of the things that we noticed, and this is, um, I would say coming more from the, the working environment is that when we would bring up the term health equity with groups that were speaking to leaders, um, it really was kind of all about uh, race and ethnicity. And um, it didn't seem like that, you know, thinking kind of beyond race and ethnicity for, for health equity reasons uh, was something that was um, part of, of the typical conversations. And so that's why we're kind of coming at this as the culturally cultural competence here in that um, while there are a small amount of uh, non-English speakers, they do exist. Um, they exist and they're growing within Vermont. And so translation and interpretation resources was a big gap. There's a, there's a, you know, a lot of kudos given to the language justice um, uh, project, um, but they are not, um, they're not able to reach everyone and also not quite, um, uh, available to at, at all times within the hospitals. I see a hand up. Owen, do you want me to pause real quick? I had I, I had two questions on the boxes in the bottom. I just wanted to clarify, make sure I understood it correctly. So um, the ones that say hospital exec, does that actually mean an executive, a C-suite level person from a hospital? Yes. Okay. Um, and then one I just didn't quite understand. Everyone in Vermont has a snowplow. What is that supposed to mean? Um, kind of in the first on that first double click bullet point here. Um, you know, when we we're bringing up, how are you thinking about caring for those that you know have tough time getting to your services during inclement weather? Um, that was the response. Okay. All right. Sorry to sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to clarify. No. Thanks. Please. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and that, putting it there because I think it's, you know, the, some of this stuff is, it, I can see that good to talk about, good to bring this up because I think that this highlights the areas where some cultural competence training um, for uh, staff about how they're working with patients and then how they're also, we move into the next one, I think here um, about the just psychologically safe work environment. Um, the, I, I haven't done walkthroughs of the hospitals yet, but what I've heard is that there are, um, the pot, like in, in some places you might find policies front and center around zero zero tolerance for hate towards workforce. Um, heard a couple stories that folks, when they do experience, when clinicians do experience um, uh, racist comments or hateful comments, it's the the typical kind of responses. Well, we'll just put, give them someone else to care for. Um, and well, I know that you know everyone deserves care. At the same time, there there are some rules and, and ways in which we can. Um, make our employees feel a little bit more psychologically safe um, as they're performing this job on the front lines. Um, and then I think the last of the the lack of coordination with caregivers here, um, the patients with the needs that are best served outside of the hospital, as we mentioned before, particularly around mental health, substance abuse, housing challenged, um, uh, and other SDOH issues, um, they are driving up ED utilization. Um, and so working to 
coordinate uh, the, the, the community services that can support these needs can decrease your ED utilization um, if, if that coordination is, is run a little bit better. Um, and then the admin resource is also something to call out here um, required for patients in the community health nurse programs to have access to Medicaid or, or getting coverage for certain things or the, the payments covering, um, the reimbursements covering those working at the nursing homes or what to, to sit in a room with a patient while they're doing telehealth um, just isn't sustainable um, from a cost perspective. And so um, I'd say that this is kind of our three main areas of observation for where there's opportunity to improve um, the health equity, uh, equitable access for these diverse populations, but also kind of for all Vermonters as well. Anything to add, Bruce? Well, as you said, um, you know, there are some bright spots here and in some of these other areas. And we'll, you know, we'll get to those in the phase of uh, thinking about what potential solutions are. Some are reasonably quick. For example, signage, right? One of the things that uh, that we heard is, boy, you know, if your language is other than English, you can't understand the bill you get from the hospital. You don't know that there are interpretive services available uh, or that someone will assist you in applying for uh, financial relief from the hospital. So some of those things could be fixed in a couple months. Other things will uh, require a lot more effort. Uh, let's go next slide. Okay, so just a thought here, because we've listed a lot of problems, and uh, you heard an extensive discussion about uh, global payments, population-based payments. Uh, I've been in that for 30 years and helped people set them up. These are the things that you really need to think about to make that successful, to optimize your chances. One is tight alignment of financial incentives among all participants. And one of the things that the hospital and some of the primary care folks noted in the discussions was those, those incentives are not aligned. Critical access hospitals get paid 101% of Medicare uh, based on their fee for service. The critical the, uh, federally qualified health centers get paid based on their prior year's budget. And so they are also incented to, you know, send care elsewhere if they can't, if they don't have it in their budget or, um, you know, to, to help get help doing, uh, doing uh, certain things from the hospital. Sharing of adequate and timely clinical information, the biggest, immediate saving uh, in any population health matter is caring for the chronically and multiply ill. The preventive services are important, but they take time to pay off. Uh, Rick Gilfillan, who was the first uh, head of the Medicare Center for uh, Innovation, uh, taught me that. You need adequate resources for primary care, mental health, and preventive service in the community, as we've talked. Uh, availability of referrals so that you can get expert help uh, and appropriate levels of care other than expensive inpatient beds and covered by the previous uh, session as well. Um, I'll note that the availability of tertiary and other services uh, to support those local hospitals is needed. Also note that currently a lot of that is provided out of state. And uh, just as an example, if someone goes to ca for cancer care to um, Dana-Farber, the Medicare payment for inpatient services is 42% higher than it will be at UB, UVM, and for ambulatory services, it's 37% higher. A GAO report on that uh, about six years ago, seven years ago. Um, next slide. Okay, so where are we? 
we are awaiting the um, availability and validation of the 2022 hospital discharge data because as we think about what options are for improving services and efficiency and effectiveness in hospitals, we wanna use the most current data uh, and certainly nothing that is well within uh, COVID or prior to COVID. Um, we are having another consulting group. It's a different uh, part of Mathematica. Uh, and we're delighted to have them to work with. Uh, and we are looking at uh, these sorts of issues, uh, the number of dual eligible individuals, uh, those getting uh, eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid in each service area because special attention to those groups can significantly reduce uh, costs. Uh, we're looking at the total volumes, both inpatient and outpatient, of certain surgical procedures at each hospital. The volumes are important measures of quality. If there is data on oh, 13 or 14 of these, uh, including in critical access hospitals, that if you're below a certain volume, the complication rates go up. Uh, and the physicians in these uh, uh, groups that we've spoken with agree with that. Uh, we're looking at volumes of potentially avoidable ED visits, hospital admissions, what those diagnoses are, what alternatives to current uh, primary care services uh, could be made available to help reduce those numbers. Uh, estimate shortfalls in care by looking at mammography and uh, colonoscopy rates as measures of uh, things that are readily available at a population level. Uh, look at the number of people leaving Vermont, which are dollars leaving the state, for care that could be provided in Vermont. And just as an example, uh, there are instances, uh, which we'll quantitate, of people being sent from Vermont to a small hospital, not Dartmouth, but a small hospital in New Hampshire. And if you send them to a 30-bed 30, 30 hospital in New Hampshire, certainly the treatment of that pneumonia, whatever, uh, could be done in Vermont were capacity available. Um, so we're in the process now of taking this information that we've presented, the reports that have been done, the data that is being analyzed and will be available, and then devising potential solutions. And I think there are some. The difficulty is the major ones are gonna take time to really uh, come to fruition. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll then uh, formulate those, and uh, and then have those hypotheses analyzed for their potential impact. I've begun to schedule visits, personal visits, to each of the hospitals, and we'll get those conducted over the next probably two two and a half months. So, but but I intend to go up, meet with the hospital uh, leader. A tour of the hospital, ask some uh, questions, meet some of the other folk, and really look at the ground. Uh, after we have the hypotheses formulated and tested, and we're going to try to predict the, the effect of these things on access to care, the hospital finances, and sustainability, and potential to improve equity. We will do this, however, in a fee-for-service world, in the current world. The, the uh, uh, questions that were asked earlier about what will this look like in a global payment is in the purview of the, uh, the other ma the Mathematica group and the, the experts you heard from earlier. Next slide. All right, and then in uh, May and June, uh, we'll get to uh, meetings in person with a joint session of the hospital leadership team and their board to present what the options might be and get their feedback. 
And we will also do that in a separate in-person meeting, town meeting style, in each hospital service area for the community members to get their feedback and any additional suggestions. Uh, and then after that, we'll reformulate those options and then bring that to the Green Mountain Care Board um, as, uh, as a set of, uh, of options and recommendations. So, Mr. Chairman, that concludes our presentation. We're happy to entertain questions. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, it was extremely informative. Um, I'll open up to the board members. Why don't we start with um, uh, members Lunge and, and Walsh uh, first, if they have anything, they can they can take the floor first. Uh, this is Tom. Um, thanks for the presentation, very informative. Um, I don't have any questions at this time. Uh, I have a question, but I don't think it needs to be answered today, but I'll just throw it out there. I'd be interested in understanding the assumptions that go into the fee for service world, because as was discussed earlier, we're currently in an all pair model world, not a true Medicare fee for service world. Um, so I'd be just interested in uh, more detail on those when that's yep. available. Yep. Thanks for the clarification, uh, Robin. I, I misspoke. It'll be the current environment, right? Thank you. That's it for me. Thanks. I just had one. Um, so your report will have things that, that hospital systems can do now and identify some gaps and opportunities. Is there is a part of your report also identifying strategies and all that the state can think about that's outside of the hospitals or is it just particular to the hospitals? No, no sir. Thank you for that question. And I, I should have said that we, we would anticipate several levels of uh, recommendations. The one certainly would be for the local hospital. The other would be uh, to your group and the state for uh, uh, changes in, uh, for example, EMS services or um, the way that uh, uh, certain people might be paid or the information system, whatever, uh, that would require either a legislative or a regulatory change. And I would also say the uh, third level would be potential changes in some of the federal things that you might either consider negotiating for as you think about a new payment model or refer to your uh, senators and congressional uh, folk for their um, uh, help. Great, thank you. Um, I don't have any other questions. It looks like Member Holmes is all set. So I will open it up to public comment via the raise the hand function. And I'll start with the healthcare advocate and uh, Mr. Schulteis. Well, I'll just keep this very brief because I'm looking at the time and I'm sure everyone has to get out. Um, Mr. Hamry, Dr. Hamry and Ms. Sutherland. So we, our office um, has been working on one of the low hanging fruits you mentioned. So the stuff around the patient financial assistance that comes from a bill that Vaz and the HCA championed um, the other, what, two years ago now. So you might wanna call uh, Mike, uh, Dr. Henry, cause our efforts along those around plain language and notice is actually pretty well developed as is a rollout plan. And that was meant, those minimum standards were meant to make things around language access and some other things a little bit clearer than the rather vague IRS regulations. Thank you. Right. So, yep, thank you. We'll, we will certainly get back to you guys, but remember these are comments that reflect the experience of the yeah, yeah. majority and other groups. So it may be older experience, but certainly what we heard. Oh, it's, 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 it hasn't been implemented at all yet. I'm just telling you that that low hanging fruit is being grabbed. Great, great to hear, thank you. And thank you, Eric. And and I I failed to mention earlier that how helpful Mike and the the healthcare advocate 
uh, group has been. So it, that was been really helpful as we have attended many of our meetings, provided real time guidance to those that were asking questions about things and sharing experiences. So uh, just sorry for not saying thank you earlier, but very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other public comment? OK, great. Um, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Henry and Ms. Sutherland and Marissa and Hillary. I, I really feel like this has been a bright spot of our work in the last year. Uh, we've learned a lot. Those meetings went exceptionally well. We all attended many of them and it was a really robust discussion and this is extremely informative. So thank you. This is really important work. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll look forward. To, we'll look forward to the coming months. Um, OK, uh, I think that concludes our agenda today. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. And all those in favor say aye. 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 And the motion carries and we are adjourned. Everyone have a nice day and I hope you get to enjoy our delayed but wonderful snow. <laughs>